sir, what do you think of the Truck Show podcast? You can hear it sucking. Ouch. Haven't even started this episode yet. Uh, that's because what they heard was the Truck Show podcast lightning. Now that I'm on it. Oh, really? It now better. it's better? Yeah. Oh, really? So yeah. I add the suckage. Lower the suckage! I can't. It's at maximum all the time. It's pinned. Oh, yeah. So nice having a Dr. Uh, Pepper Fridge. Thank you, Jason Broom. I'll forever love you. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so cold. Yeah. Oh, man. That's good on the throat, let me mm-hmm. tell you. That's what she said. All right. Well, it is the Truck Show Podcast. I'm lighting his home, and we're in the the, uh, the pod shed, as uh, he calls it. I don't like to, but that's just what it seems Are to be. Are you going to... You just have to stop talking about the pot shed. I, you know what? Like you have a habit of talking about things you don't like that you have to deal with, and mm-hmm. I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah, but people don't want to hear you complaining about the pot. This shed. will be the last time I t- talk about the place we're sitting in doing <sighs> the, the, the podcast. Can I just uh, can I just bring something up here? Are you going to jump into email before we've even began the show? Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a, there's something in here. Uh, this one's from uh, Kelly Nauman. Says, uh, "Hey, Lighting Holman." Just wondered if lighting spackled the new pod shed when it was built. <laughs> and on your shirt ideas, lighting's wall spackling service. Hopefully you remember the episode I'm referencing. Are y'all going to have tall shirts for those of us that need longer shirts? I hope y'all do a better job sending them out than you did when you first started the podcast. Mounter your parameters and five stars, Kelly Nolman. Mounter, monitor, key, engine, parameters. Five star review, five stars! Thank Off you. To a, uh, off to a great start. Thank you, Kelly Nauman. Uh, I believe there might have even been a uh, a a voicemail left on the five star hotline six five seven two zero five sixty one zero five that may have referenced you and your pod shed hate. Really? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. This is your deal, Jay. The Truck Show Podcast brought to you from the pod shed. The pod shed. The pod shed, the pod shed, and then you go on from there. It's that easy. The pod shed is the place. The Truck Show Podcast from the pod shed. You got my vote. Nope. Yep. Hey, listen, the listeners have spoken. (laughs) I want to make sure we get a couple of these in because I don't know how long our our, our interview is going to be, and we haven't even talked about all the things that went on this week. Uh, you wired your tunnel cover finally after love a month. Love it. I love it. Uh-huh. I know I talked about my EGR roll track in the yes. last episode, guys, but I am telling you that no matter what roll top bed cover you've owned, it blows by comparison. I thought you were going to say it blows them away. The, I'm You're saying, saying what they own blows in comparison. Yes. Not the EGR when you just I uh, would I be this excited if it blew? No, yes. I'm saying what they own blows by comparison. Okay, what you have is awesome. The it EGR is, is getting is, the lightning seal of approval. It is epic. It is so well designed. It's nice. quiet. It's sturdy. See, isn't it fun it when is, you have a guest who tells you all those things, and then you're like, okay, we'll see. And then but you again, install, and it is. every guest wants us to believe that they make the greatest of thing course. ever, right? And, and now? I wouldn't be talking about it if it weren't amazing. I would just not talk about it. I would say, hey, thanks for EGR for supplying a roll track. Uh-huh. And that's all I would say. Okay. This is next level. The engineering, the Australians that designed this are mad scientists. All the drains, all the way around, the way it furls and unfurls, uh-huh. it's very, very quiet. I can't find anywhere where water could get in. I think that I should. So, what you're go saying inside. is you're happy? Very much so. I'm willing to go inside. Have you in closed a car the wash? bed? Yep. And drive through a you drive, drive through car wash. You drive well, except the guys at Expel would, would be upset <laughs> because we promised the Expel oh, yeah. guys no, we no, wouldn't no, go a, through a car a wash. Touchless car wash. Even still, they're using we don't know what detergents sure. they're using and all that stuff. But I want to put something that's valuable in the back. Yeah. And then have you there with me spraying it down with a pressure you know washer. What? I should cover the entire bed in uh, Kool-Aid powder. And then that way, if it leaks, it just turns into a red cherry Kool-Aid mess. And if it doesn't, no, you just blow it out with that, a blower. But that would be sticky. It was gross. Yeah, it was no, gross. I don't want that. It's a full thing full it of powder. It would be funny. Powdered Kool-Aid. Yeah, it, it would, would be, be funny. It would be funny, but it would be super sticky well, forever. I just got back from pre-running in the desert with a, uh, a client of Use I know. Adventure. And thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. I told that. you that wasn't a uh, lightning thing. That was a work thing, yeah. lightning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I may have uh, gotten a flyby from uh, Dave, the founder of AEV was out flying his plane and said, "Hey, I just saw you were needles. I'll uh, I'll come by and find you." And he came by and you know flew around with his plane and that was pretty good. 
So he was already in the air. Uh, he was well. He was uh, staying out in Henderson, and he's been taking his uh, his plane out and flying it around the desert and stuff. And so he's hit me up a few times. Hey, some, what are some of those desert cool patent desert training centers? So I gave, uh, gave him some points of interest to go find in his plane while he's out putting around. So he wanted to go flying. So. He didn't have any particular destination, so he found the bright red Jeep in the middle of the uh, trail in the Mojave Desert. So he buzzed you. I'm not going to say that he <laughs> buzzed me. Oh, is that se. illegal? Yes, that's oh. illegal. No, he, he did a flyby, and he waved. At whatever the legal minimum altitude At is. 501 feet. I that's see. 100% correct. Okay. So it was, uh, that was kind of fun. So that was the, the maiden voyage. Did 200 miles off-road in that thing. <sighs> you know what you need? Hmm. EGR roll track. No, no, I don't. Oh, that's right. I don't no have a, a bed. In a Jeep. <laughs> All I'm saying is 200 miles, that thing was sublime. It was so good. Like, I loved everything about my old V6 Jeep. Yeah, this is just next level. The power, they you literally low for long at the trail, like, you know, 1500 RPM. It's like, it doesn't care. It just does its thing. I didn't even I think that's what you say the last time. It's Jeep don't care. Jeep don't care. It just goes. And, uh, if I wanted to go fast, I'd go fast. If I wanted to go slow, it felt like a marshmallow. It just soaked everything up, all the different modes, off-road plus, where you can take off your sway bar and four high. and It's just so so awesome. And I was leading a, a group of vehicles from uh, a company that uh, loves our podcast. Really? And uh, I'll tell more about it uh, next month because I'm going to be doing some stuff out with this particular company. Wh- how much do they love us? Enough to be partners? Uh, they uh, presenting partners. No way. Thing? Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. It's what I'm saying. Yeah, it was awesome. So uh, had a chance to uh, see a particular uh, midsize pickup truck in uh, in action out on the trail. And uh, wait, a particular midsize pickup truck. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, speaking of uh, midsize pickup trucks off road with companies that love the podcast, uh, we have to thank our friends over at Nissan. Yes, we do for uh, presenting uh, the show to you. If it weren't for Nissan, we probably wouldn't have lasted. Geez, our five-year anniversary is coming up in like three weeks. Can you believe that? What do we do to celebrate our five-year anniversary? I have no. We I built a pod shed. But is this for like you. Uh, this is this is my um, this is my homage to you? No, it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Not, no, this is your man cave. Mm. Everyone knows that this is your no. excuse to make a man cave. I, I, how is this a man cave? It has microphones and computer equipment. It looks like a studio, but acts like a man cave. Why? Because there's a 42-inch TV on the wall and a sound system uh, and a, a cigar lounge. Cool. Like I wish there's a cigar lounge. This would be great. You need a humidor. Oh. Humid a fire. Humid a humidor. Humidor. There's gonna be a whiskey over. <laughs> in this corner though i gotta find the right uh the, the right uh, we piece do of need whiskey in here i don't drink whiskey mm. but i will start oh okay I'll, then we may introduce you to a new bottle of whiskey each week if you can teach me the differences uh-huh. i would be uh, right. very appreciative then there's gonna be a whiskey shelf right over here i'd also like to invite some of our friends from nissan to uh imbibe Partake. in some whiskey ah, I, I would love for uh, our friends uh you know colin price or dan pass or uh brian brockman don't or they have other? offices out here no they're in tennessee well, then they, they used to have offices out here, but they come out here. We should have Janelle Grigsby. She's our uh, our Nissan West Coast pre- uh, rep. She'd have I'll whiskey with pick us. her up from the airport. She lives here. Oh, well, yeah. then even better. Even better. I'll pick her up from her Did house. Did you see what's still in the driveway? Yes, the Titan. <laughs> <laughs> the Platinum Reserve still hanging out, taking up a space in, uh-huh. in Holman's four-car-wide driveway. Yeah. Yeah, it's still here. Must be nice. driving it. Nah, it goes back this week. Sure, you said it was going back last week. I I might have to uh, go down to the local Nissan dealer afterwards, though, and uh, pick myself up something because I'm going to miss it that much. What would you buy? Would you buy another? Would you fill it with a Titan or Frontier? No, you get Frontier. You would? Yeah. Okay. Just a round town truck? Just something something basic, simple to, to uh, you know, put miles on? Yeah. Frontier would be perfect. I don't need a big old truck. I just need a... I, I miss having a pickup truck. I miss... I, I will miss... Just being able to toss stuff in back. But but you, I have you, you so mi- it'll be you, fine. You miss uh, guys going, hey, Holman, I need to move a couch. Mm, no, don't I don't miss that. that. No, that's 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 true. <laughs> that is something that happens when you buy a truck. All right, well, and if you buy a Nissan, it will carry all that stuff I was gonna say, very, if, very well. If you're the guy who likes to help your friends move couches and big screen TVs and mulch, then uh, mulch. definitely go down to your local <laughs> Nissan dealer or head over to NissanUSA.com where you can build and price the Nissan Frontier, Titan, or Titan XD of your dreams. Of course, the Titan and Titan XD come with the industry's best five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. If you're stuck with a truck that just won't get out of its own way, you might need to look at a Banks Pedal Monster. Banks Pedal Monster is a throttle sensitivity controller that gets rid of your turbo lag. When you step down on the pedal, you want it to feel like it's cable actuated, but it just isn't. The OEMs designed the pedal so it responds the way they want it to respond, but not the way that 
you want it to respond. With the Pedal Monster, you remap the pedal to give you the response that you want. Head over to bankspower.com, type in your year, make, and model to find one for your truck. And then you guys may have seen a uh, slightly uh, more pervasive truck show podcast, a social presence lately. That's because of our friends at Full Moon Digital who are helping us out to uh, get the new uh, truck show podcast company off the ground. They're also experts at search engine optimization. You've heard the term SEO. What does that mean? They go through and make sure that your website can be found when people are looking for what you sell. Do you want to be at the top of the search results? They can make that happen. Look them up at fullmoondigital.com. All right, Lightning, before you play the intro, I've got some breaking news for you. This just in. Yep. To the Truck Show Podcast World Headquarters of the Pod Shed in Huntington Beach, <laughs> California. I didn't know we had a world headquarters. Yeah, we do. Okay. Sean Holman's neighbors, the most awful humans in the world, are moving. No way. Yeah. What? Tell me more. Did you see the for sale sign and the open house going on no, next door? No, I raced right in here. Dude, they uh, they put their house up for sale this week. Oh, I, I did see two family. I figured they were throwing a party because no. there were people walking in and out of the front door. No, the pod shed is what pushed them over the edge. I had neighbors coming up uh, congratulating me for the world's worst neighbors finally moving away. So they want to be pod shed free? Uh, they want to be pod shed <laughs> free. So it might have... Uh, here's the thing. If it weren't for uh, my previous employer laying me off and forcing me to build a pod shed in my backyard, I may still have to live next to the world's worst neighbors. Dude, you're so excited. I'm so lucky. I'm blessed. Your wife's got to be stoked as Everybody's well. Everybody's happy. Ah, it's just, <laughs> it's so freeing. Wow, you guys, you, you can't see what I'm looking at. He's yeah. glowing. Nah, it's, been, it's been a really rough five years. You know what? Here, I'm gonna, just pause for a second. Yeah. Take a swig off your Dr. Uh, Pepper and enjoy this moment. Congrats, my friend. The Truck Show. We're going to show you what we know. Show. We have the lifted, we have the lowered, and everything in between. We'll talk about trucks that run on diesel and the ones that run on gasoline. The truck show, the truck show, the truck show. Whoa, whoa. It's the truck show with your hosts, Lightning and Holman. Now, Holman, I feel kind of bad because uh, Jerry's just standing outside the pod shed door looking in like a, uh, a lost puppy dog. Should we bring him in? Uh, that's not his lost puppy dog look. That's his, why am I here on a Sunday talking to you two? Look. I, I just sold my company. And <laughs> yeah, I, I don't uh, need I this in my life anymore. Jerry, come in. Jerry Zayden from Camberg Engineering in the house. In the shed. Yeah, in the shed. <laughs> That's the only time I'm going to do that. Everyone hates that. <laughs> See? Oh, Jerry's uh, oh, hitting my no. bell. He's the first guest to ever hit my bell. He rang your bell. He rang my bell. Hey, it's yes. on my side of the table. It's behind your laptop. That's he's, true. he's got this full digital I know you like his, sound effects yeah. machine. Look at that thing. It's like Simon Says over there. And I got the ring for service bell. <laughs> Like, and, nobody, and nobody's coming. Yeah, no one's coming. <laughs> that is usually like, you know, hot chick or that type of thing. Is That's what that bell is. Or or like no, it's, good news. No, no, no come that, take my order bell. That bell is for when somebody blasts you on email and then I'm excited it's, about it. It's that it. too. That's yes, what that Which happens is. quite often, sadly. So, uh, so Jerry is a, uh, well, let's see. We haven't had you on since the beginning of the show, which is like five years ago now. And you're an HB local, and we're in HB, and Can, you, well, I have, you to have big them. news that just happened. Well, yeah, but before, we're going to get to the big news. Yeah. That's big news. Can you believe that we're still doing it five years later? Like, seriously. It is pretty wild, you know? Podcast. You, you saw us when we were little baby podcasters. Yeah, like we drove into Santa Ana, yeah. down an alley, and down a street. <laughs> Passed a bunch of people crack on Crack dealers. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I think, they just, I think the Walking Dead extras are like hanging out. This here. is way better than the old old studio, right? Yeah, this is actually my old stomping grounds. Like if you just nice. go down Edwards to the hill, yep. I lived right at the bottom of that hill back in the wetlands, yep. and I had friends in this neighborhood, and my wife So used my to parents, teach. where I grew up, is Springdale and Slater. Oh, okay, So I was cool. right, right down there, one track north of basically all the wetland houses. Yeah, my wife yeah. used to teach across Isle there at Springview. Yep, there you go. So. Small world in Huntington. I know. This is a little microcosm of automotive. If you don't know i mean there's so many companies that are along this little stretch in hb there's a gazillion little automotive places oh so this is not me being california pompous this is now you this is no no this is me being hb pompous i see you're yeah. from the lbc we don't care oh yeah, you're on the other yeah. side of the orange curtain my man uh, jerry was in the lbc earlier today at the quarantine cruise is that right 
Yeah, yeah. I went to the uh, first stop. I stayed in the Orange County side at uh, SoCo. <laughs> oh, 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 wait. You didn't go to LBX over there? No, we went to church this morning. You poser. Um, yeah, I know. I know. I brought uh, one of my – I just bought a new vintage ride. I took that there. My son picked up a Bronco. I got a 95 uh, Porsche 911 that – like total – I saw that at, yeah. at Supercar Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's funny because um, I'm always scouring Craigslist and I'm like, oh, this is too good to be true, but I'm going to call on it. Yeah. And it was part of an estate sale. And um, there you go. 28,000 miles on a 95 Whoa. Porsche. Excuse Last, me? Yeah, exactly. And it was beat up from the feet up or not? No, it's beautiful. It's, black on black. So Looks that would new. be a 993, right? Correct. So 993 is the last of the air-cooled 911s. And to me, that's the best out of all of them because you had just enough modern touches to it and comfort. But it was still everything. It's the same size as the original 911. Like basically the body shell stayed the same all those years, had a more powerful engine, was still air cooled. And it's still, it's classically Porsche. When you went to the 996s, everything kind of got bigger. And and you've got a later generation Porsche. You got a, what, a GT2? Uh, it's a 992 GT3. GT3. So it's the newest yeah. GT3. And that yeah. one's got so, all the accoutrement. Well, which, accoutrement but, that you will need. Accoutrement. So my point <laughs> on that is the Porsche Pyrrhus kind of stop at the 993, although I think most of them have come around. You've got both now, which is awesome because you've got the old school represented and you've got the literally the state of the art. And man, the new Porsches are freaking um, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, way too much for the street, honestly. I mean, you, I get asked all the time, which one do you like better? And I'm like, well, I had a 964. Those are badass. And then this 993 is really perfect. Like if you're going to buy one and spend the money, just buy a 993. But they're so expensive now. Like people know, and 96, I mean, you're looking at 20 plus years old now. I mean, that's, it's classic car territory. And those are the cars we grew up with. I mean, I was. That's why he took it to the quarantine cruise. It's classic cars. I mean, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying that finding those things now is before it was like, oh, it's, you know, we all want the new water cooled, bigger, more comfortable Porsches. Now everybody's like, oh, 993. Pfft. Like the, it's all, it's like the Land Cruiser 80 series, like the last of that, 60 that series gen- or even 60 yeah, series. It's like really like same era. And what's wild is when you look at production numbers, even modern day, like right now, Porsche globally sells 250,000 vehicles. Man, so Ford sells 800,000 F-Series bikes, right. for example. Yeah, like a million F-Series trucks in a year. Toyota sells, you know, way more Camrys than Porsche sells sure. around the whole world. Yeah, right? the entire uh, manufacturing. Yeah, and so, you know, the there's just something about 90s cars kind of coming back as good. Yeah. Where, like, 80s cars were kind of... Uh, so it's it funny. like an era, right? Yeah, funny you say that. So, like, the, the really late 70s, 78, 79, and then... Most of the 80s up to till maybe 87, 88, I think there's some 88, 89s that get a pass. But I think because of smog pump, smog regulation, they weren't super powerful. Um, well, let's be real. It's the government effed it up. Oh, oh for sure. That's just what it so is. So people have kind of leapfrogged the 80s. And now all the 90s, especially the JDM stuff, like yeah. Supra Turbos. Are I free- used to work on those. Those, those things are off awesome. the charts yeah. in terms of money now. Oh, they're like a hundred grand. Uh, at least. Yeah. When I worked at uh, Rod Miller Motorsport, like 93, 94, that era, RX-7, oh, Super yeah. Turbos, Alltrack yeah. Celica Turbos. Integra Mazda, Type yeah. R's. You get all you know, that, Civic yeah. SIs. I mean, all that stuff is starting to get really expensive. And um, there's just something. And then, of, of course, the mini truck scene from that era too, right? So you get the Toyota trucks, the hard bodies. Toyota trucks are coming back hard. Like yeah. I would love to find... An extra cab, four cylinder stick shift, yep. like a ninety to ninety five, and like then do first it right. A ninety five, no, it's stock, rims, tires, yeah. some shocks. That's it. No Renaults, uh, oh, teddy bear Renaults. <laughs> yeah, only if they're teddy bears. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Oh, we were talking about you know Scott Birdsall. He uh, owns Old Smokey, the Cummins powered. 19 what what year is his uh, F1? Uh it's uh 49, 49 right? 49. Yeah. He want, he's got the the high speed Pikes, high, Peak, the, Pikes Peak record for yeah. fat, uh, quickest diesel. diesel up the hill. Oh, yeah. Wow. And yeah. then last year he took his Lama prototype car which is an eco diesel powered. Yeah, 3 liter. Yeah, 3 liter out of like a Ram or a Jeep. Wow. And this year he's going back with that same Lama prototype supercharged twin turbo eco diesel. But he's doing but a land speed record. That's out why of a, I brought it up. A super cab Toyota with a two JZ in it. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so that thing that thing's super rad. And, and will it have a tonneau cover? I don't know. He's got a rendering on it. It'll be interesting. To I don't see think what he's doing a tonneau on it. Yeah, I mean that thing's probably going to get gutted and tubed and all that. I don't know what class he's in, so I'm not but sure. That's back to that debate. On it's kind class. of a yeah. What gets better, gas yeah, mileage, tonneau cover, tonneau cover or, or tailgate, tailgate down. down? Yeah. yeah. 
probably a Tano. Oh, tailgate down. We know doesn't. But I think he's tailgate the ultimate. down. That was the biggest bogosity ever. I think so. Like, so yeah. this will be the test, right? Because yeah. he'll be like, "Oh, I went five miles an hour faster this way." Yeah. And then you know. The then you know for sure. Right? I mean, someone knows somewhere. Toyota or someone put that in a wind tunnel, and they know. But like the whole tailgate down thing, I just I yeah. Wanna, but they I sold reach. a lot of tailgate nets. Think they of the did. dude. The they dude did. who came up with the tailgate net. It's a flow through tailgate. That dude's rich today. Or he did like a lot of lines of coke or something back in the nineties. What's the brand? It. I, it's got the um, the horns on the back. No, it was Gator Net or something, Gator, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that it was one Ga- of them. Yeah, I at remember, least that's uh, what I remember being around here. I remember back in the day, right? We had Dixie Peck off road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, oh wow! Yeah, people would get the yep. the lights and the little like what was it? The bed stiffeners. And yeah. Oh yeah, and yeah. And, like. It, they would have it all decked well, out. If you're going to jump your truck, you got to stiffen up the bed so they <laughs> don't collapse outward on you. Yeah, so you're drilling holes everywhere <laughs> know, just right. to mount these. Well, because the, the tailgate oftentimes would just come open. Yeah, right? you'd hit a bump and the tailgate would just flop. Right, yeah, kind of like know. the new Ram trucks. Ouch. Because the re- there's a recall on uh-huh. this right now. The oh, tailgate just comes out. Has you yours done all that? Your cargo. No, but I have the recall. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's sitting on my desk at home. I got to take it well, in. The recall notice. Recall notice. You haven't, you haven't done it yet. No, I have not. Yeah, huh. Yeah, uh-huh. you take it in. So we just had a listener uh, send us an email a couple days ago, and he has a, I think he it was a Toyota Extra Cab, probably like late 80s, and he's like, thanks to the show, I'm redoing it. And he had, I want to say it was something like a two-inch spindle lift or something, he's going to lower it. He goes, I've never had a lowered car, but I've already, he's got a uh, Chevy uh, ZR2 with a bunch of AV stuff or overlanding. He goes, I already have my off-road vehicle. I want to slam the Toyota now and kind of relive the Mini. I was like, Right on, dude. That's awesome. So, Jerry, you would get one to just leave it stock, or would you like- four wheel drive? Yeah, like extra cab, four cylinder, four wheel. Back drive. to the future truck. No, next generation because okay. that was the eighties. This like yeah. eighty nine. Oh yeah, yeah. The, you you want the rounded, rounded body? Yeah, yeah. yeah, way better. Way so better. So my huh? first truck was an eighty nine. I call it the gardener truck. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like the standard cab, like all, like all the mini. Trucks, Do you remember right? the mini trucks that were one tons? The Toyota one tons. Yeah, the oh. long bed. <laughs> I had one of those at Norm Reeves Honda as a parts driver. Nice. And it had uh, it had a two RE in it with I think it was five hundred thousand miles, and that thing sounded like a diesel. But it started up every day. Yeah, they drove it all the time. Timing change. <laughs> yep. It's easy. But yeah, the four cylinder, you know, I'd want it kind of manual, like roll up windows, push door locks, uh, have to be extra cab, but you get the manual shift into four high, four yeah, low, yeah, yeah. manual gearbox, like a five And speed. Toyotas were always cool because you sat on the floor and your feet were out in front of you like this because you're super low. And it was Very almost race like a, car. Yeah, it's like a lifted sports car. And I always thought it was weird wheeling those because you're like... The position, you're not like upright in a couch, you're like just, you're like laid out in it. Yeah, it's just like a Land Cruiser, like yeah. that era. And so it's like 89 to the first half of 95, and then yeah. 95 and a half was the Tacoma launch, which yeah. changed, right? So Although you, you don't want the, or maybe it was the, the, no, it was the last version of the rounded Toyota trucks that didn't have a name. I think it was 94, 95, had the third brake light. On the cab. Remember, they just added yes. that little, it looked like a big zip sitting on the top of that. That truck yeah. was so good. And it's like, oh, now it's got the third brake light on top. Yeah, they added that little plastic thing above the center of the yeah. Now, would you go get the Alpine of the era, the 7618 or whatever it was back in 95 so it matched the truck? A hundred percent. And yeah. what's cool about the four-wheel drive trucks is they came with the double din yeah. with oh. the little pocket under the stereo. Yep. So back in the day, like... Put your wallet I, or your CDs? Yeah, well, I had the extra cab two-wheel drive truck, and I had it all full of woofers and stereo and stuff. I, that was kind of my first in the automotive industry was... I'll make a long story very short. So my first truck... We like long stories, by the way. No, okay. no I was okay. going to say, that's funny, because we do the same thing, but the opposite. We, we make short, short stories, stories long. long. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I got this 89 Toyota pickup truck, total surprise. You know, I guess it's... Uh, only, only child privilege, right? So my parents, I thought I was getting my dad's, what was it, uh, um, Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra Brome, 1985, and Oof. steering wheel with your <laughs> finger, yeah. like so Oof. easy. And I'm like, hey, I could put, it's got rails, I could put surf racks on the roof, I'm good. Like, yeah. I didn't even really care, right? I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. I'd like a truck, but whatever. Well, my birthday's in January for Christmas. I got a stocking, and in the stocking was a key to a Toyota key. And I'm like, oh, what's this? We got you a new truck. And I'm like, no way. That's where we use the bell, by the way. Yeah, that's the bell. And so it, it was pretty dope. I was like, I was not. What color? White. Giant, by the way, blue you, vinyl seat. you have carried that tradition to your kids who have gotten some pretty cool first cars. Yeah, but I did it a little differently, right? So with my son, it was like, 
whatever you save, I'm going to match. And so he, he wanted a manual, nice. which was great. So he got a manual high mileage Tacoma, loved it, flipped it, got another one, flipped it. <laughs> so he's got my No, you mean like, fl- sure. flipped like it for sold sale. It, not sold actually it. flipped it in the desert. No, no, not rolling over. <laughs> okay. Flipping right, yeah. like the sale yeah. thing. Because well, you would have been pretty flippant. Say, hey, flipped it over and Joshua Tree and then he got him another one. And, and yeah, jumped it 10. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> So I got this new truck, no stereo, no air conditioning, nothing, right? It was just strippy, like vinyl floor, vinyl seat, roll-up windows. Then for my birthday, it was like, hey, you know, we're going to buy you a stereo. And so they gave me like a whatever it was, 300 bucks or five, whatever it was, which was a ton of money back then. Sure. So I go to um, Henry's Auto Sound on Beach. Oh, my God. God, I love Henry's. Yes. Right? Yeah. I knew one of the guys that worked there because the roller rink was a really popular thing and that guy hung out there. And he's like, oh, come in. We'll take care of you and get you a little bit of a deal. So I go in and I could either get the tape deck pull out. <laughs> sure. Take it with you. Yeah, two Pioneer speakers in the door installed. Six by nines. No, like no. Uh, six, six and a half rounds. Six and a half rounds. Oh. Because I had wing windows so they could fit the six. Oh, oh there it. you go. Okay. If you didn't have wing windows. You, you had to then get you, well, Then you could put anything if you put a step out, like an inch and a half, you know, riser all the but way around it. this is pre-step out. Okay. So the, the guys like would use, you know, MDF or particle. Oh, yeah. Build like, yeah, anyways. Or I could do CD player, but I had to install it myself. Mm. And I'm like, I really like techie stuff. So like, I'm like, I can't go tape. and I need CD. It's better, yeah, right? Yeah, it's so I bought the CD player and they drew a little schematic like this color wire goes there and double check these wires with the battery, a nine volt battery, and it'll pop the speakers and you can kind of hear it. Sure. So I figured it out. I, I literally used a sta- – I took the stencil and stenciled it where I'm drilling the thing and I double checked behind – and I used a steak knife to cut the door <laughs> panel, which okay. is really compressed. Like, yeah, it's just like particle cardboard, board. Cardboard, yeah. but particle yeah. board, yeah. right? It worked. It took me a while. almost sliced off a finger. But, hey, got speakers in the door. It worked. And I uh, got the stereo in there. Same thing. I had to cut the plastic. So it was a singled-in thing. So I'm going back to my double dent. Double dent, yeah. yeah. So I had that truck. And then my friend's older brother... He had a like an '83 Toyota 4x, and they put like four eight-inch woofers behind the back seat. And I'm like, oh well, I want woofers now. So you know, I had a job. I actually worked at breakfast in the park down the oh, street, yeah. flipping still, pancakes still there. and stuff. Yeah, and so um, you know, I made a little bit of money back then, so I saved up and bought a Sanyo 5050 amp from Henry's because they love those for some reason. They God, those Sanyo amps. sucked balls. But that I amp mean, was not the, that the amp. amp. Yeah, the amp, amp was cool. There was some. You got to have one signature product that gets you, you know, that you put your effort into so that your name is good and then they'll buy all the rest of the crap that you make. So anyways, I I get this in the truck, get some woofers. Now, I'm five foot four and a 105 on my driver's license and I lied. So I was tiny. The truck worked great. Then all of a sudden I grew and I'm (laughs) almost six three now. So I'm driving this truck where I built a box behind the seat where like (laughs) it was like the front of it and the sides and then it was kind of fiberglass to the back of the cab, and there was no wood on the back. But that's like what you did on a little slant. Did you glass motors. it yourself? I did, dude. So I had a neighbor. Five. Yeah, I had a neighbor. Glass work. Surf, surf world like Huntington. Well, I was going to say like, oh, it was probably had to be a surfboard guy that yeah. had the materials and stuff, right? And then we got the Pink Panther home insulation and stuff yeah. in there. And then yeah, I had two eights and a little Sanyo fifty fifty. If and, only you knew where that truck was today, it'd be interesting to see. Oh, would you buy that last the test of time? You know, it would be interesting to see. What that truck would look like today? I bet yeah. you it's so it's it's gone. Yeah. It has to be gone. There's none of those. And, it, and if it's not gone, it's in Mexico. It's, yeah. it would be most sad of them have looking. gotten stolen, and they get, take them down to Mexico because yeah. the U.S. trucks are, you know, easy to acquire yeah. and then get rid of. So I had that for a minute. Then I got an extra cab truck. So I'm like, now I'm working. Now you've got room for your money. legs. I got room. Well, let's be real. I had room for <laughs> woofers. Yep, so I had that's exactly cab. right. So, so every time he hit the uh, clutch, his knee would bang the dash. Oh, dude, it was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. So I get the extra cab, and uh, Kicker was a brand that just kind of came on the scene. One of my friends, Bobby, he had Kicker. And we used to go all the way. I want to say it's like San Pedro. It's like PCH in Torrance, like that area, where FMF used to be back in the day. And it was called Crazy Stereo, and they sold Kicker. So we'd drive all the way there. Different than Crazy Gideon in the Not not Crazy Gideon. (laughs) Um, So I got the extra cab. This is all dialed in. And it's not the greatest thing, but it's something I did myself. 
Well, I blew a fuse. And so I'm leaving my friend's house who lived in Huntington Harbor right there. I'm turning left and I'm going down PCH heading back to Huntington and I'm all oh, stereo shop. So I pull in like, hey, can I buy a fuse? They blew one out. So the owner is a Korean dude, comes down and he's looking and he goes, who put this in? And I go, I did it. And he calls Mario over. Mario's their head installer and they're like, hey, we're looking for a guy. Are you interested in a job? Now I'm in high school. I'm a junior in high school and I'm like, Ding, ding, you could ring the bell. Like, yes, I want to work at a stereo shop. <laughs> yeah. I, I dropped everything because I'm like, now I, I get paid to work on yeah, cars. Yeah, that makes two of us. And it's just like anyone passionate in the automotive world. Like, you get the opportunity to make a dollar doing You what go you do love. it. You just go do or it. Or like we tell people, if you get an opportunity to work for free and learn and t- tell the guy who owns the shop, I'll work for free for a couple months. And if I'm worthwhile, like, let's talk about it. Like, go learn, go do it, get your name and your foot in the door, show them you're passionate because that's how you get in. A hundred percent. And unfortunately now, when you do that, the kid who works for you goes, oh, well, I didn't get paid my hours. And then the government makes you have penalties and all yeah. kinds of bull crap. So yeah. that's, it, it's a sad thing at our government, like the whole internship, right? Totally. That's why we've never done it. Gig economy here. I mean, everything. I mean, even even me being a uh, independent person now with my own company, having to do everything the right way so that I can submit a 1099 so I get yes. sucked into the W-2 stuff. I'm like, I, I don't want a W-2. Yeah. I work for myself. I want to do a service for you, and then you pay me for the service. And there's yeah. a whole, whole thing in California about how you can do that and not do that, and it's, it's ugly. a mess. Yeah. I, w- I was an intern for over a year at K-Rock, at the radio station. And back then, interns were unpaid. Now, interns, by law, you have to be paid. So there are very few internships, and internships are... The ones that are available Which is are hard why, to come uh, by. Truck Famous LLC has zero interns. Right. Yeah. Maybe my daughter. Can't pay them, yeah. Maybe my oldest. She'll, she'll work for free in the family business. <laughs> so you are talking to Mario. Mario is impressed or someone's impressed. I, just the fact that I guess I can do it, right? So I get to work under Mario. Dude's from Compton. Just He's got his, like, I forget what year Thunderbird it was. Like a yeah. 90 Thunderbird. He had two 12s in the trunk. Sounds so clean. And it was a Ryan amp. So he had two of the 225 HCCA amps. And this is the total cheater homage amps, right? So they're 25 watts a channel, red amps that you can just, 25 by four? No, 25 by two. By two, One okay. of them's for all the mids and highs, okay. one yes. of them for the, for the sub. But you can cheat them down to like an ohm and a half, can't you? Half ohm. Half, holy crap. So then they're putting out like yeah, 600 crazy watts. wattage. Yeah. yeah, so it's just like this whole thing, like how they work. And so. that's where you use math, kids. Yeah, so basically like... Home's law! Yeah, so you get one speakers, four ohms, and then when you put two speakers, then you have two ohms and two more, right? Or you get the way you wire them up in series or parallel, just kind of how the whole thing works. So really learned a lot working for that guy. And we used to go to Compton, and we were probably a couple of the only white kids there. And just the, the whole culture embraced everybody. It didn't matter. Yeah, if right? you were into car audio, you were into car audio. Yeah, you were just yeah. They wanted it was what you had, you what they had. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's like the dudes with the hydraulics and the and Mario Dayton's on that 90 Thunderbird, by the way. Like he really had like chrome Dayton's. Yeah. Like it was a thing. And I was Roland watching, D's. Yeah, and I was watching him like use the lead hammer to put the <laughs> spinner on. The spinner on, on, yeah. The knockoff, and he fully whacked the valve stem and pissed <laughs> all the It was awesome. <laughs> Never seen anyone get that mad before, yeah. But yeah, really good good time in my life. It was a lot of fun. How long were you there? I was there until I used my business sense. So the Korean owner, so we were a GTE mobile communications dealer, which meant we sold cell phones. Oh, and you had pagers too during the PageNet craze. Yeah. So I had a pager in school. People would be like, why do you have a pager? You're drunk dealer. Zero, zero, eight, five. Yep. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> and um, it was crazy because, uh, so he's Korean owner, so he had his Korean newspaper. I came in, and this is where I kind of like learned how to market stuff. I was always flipping things. But his ad looked like a swap meet. I'm like, no, we got to clean this up. Use the Alpine Lambo and don't put any prices in the ad. The Alpine Lambo. Yes. It was yeah. white, if I remember, right? So you know the car fidelity that was on the side of the 55 freeway. Yeah, I remember that I place. worked there. Oh, no way. I was there. So I worked at Car Fidelity for Ken and Sven. They own 16 locations. Oh, wow. And this is in 8990. Yes. Yeah, so so this is during that, that time, yeah, during that same era, because I was doing the stuff in my parents' garage and they're like, enough of this. Yeah. And it was all cash. I'm like, all right, I need to be legit. There's stuff I don't know. And I closed up the shop in my parents' garage and got a job. You uh, mean your mom working. kicked you out? They, they literally kicked me out. <laughs> Dude, I, had, I had pegboard of all the metric kits. I could install anything and anything with yeah. all my single to dual DIN and all the wiring harness adapters and whatnot. Awesome. And so I bailed there and, and I got a job. First, it was at the Orange location. They had a brand new Orange location, which 
it, was, it didn't get much business. They needed help at the one with the Lamborghini on the side of the building in Newport Beach. So I went there and oh, I was man. there for over a year. That that era, like there's just those high end shops that were there, right? And everyone would me remember Camelot. Did you ever go there? Of course, in that Anaheim. That was like a spot. Are yeah. you kidding me? I used to. I was the kid that dropped the oil on the ground so we could do burnouts. Nice. We would drop. Anything we can that was slick. Yep. As you're turning left off Kramer, yeah. You would is it Kramer or no? Uh, the, the Orange Thorpe. You're turning left into where you're going to Camelot, and we would dump all the oil as we made a left really slowly. So when other cars were going in or out, they could just light them up, smoke, nice. and the cops let it happen for years. It was there for a while. We would meet off of uh, like by Knott's Berry Farm at a Carl's Jr., and then we'd go to the other Carl's. Dude, Jr. that Camelot. Carl's was hopping. Wasn't that it? That Carl's and the Carl's right by well, Camelot. Yeah. And then they were crazy. And then Fuddruckers came in to try and capture all that car culture and was there right across the street. I don't remember that. Yeah, the Fuddruckers right up okay. just north of Knott's Berry Farm on Beach. Those okay. were great yeah. crew spots. Yeah, yeah, it was so much fun back then. And um, anyway, so back to that stereo shop. Recycler was such a big thing. And I'm like, nope, no half page garage sale. Ad. For those of you listening, the Recycler was a one penny newsprint selling thing that you could get. There's a recycler, there's the auto trader, there was a few I, of those. I always, I always paid $1.25 for it. How yeah, much did you pay it was, for it? It was about, 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 was it about that much. There was yeah. one that I, were, I don't remember. You're talking about the penny saver. Well, maybe that. And then there's those penny saver, auto trader. Yeah. Yeah. So the recycler was yeah. Craigslist as a newspaper. Exactly. Best That's way to put it. And Craigslist today still looks like a newspaper. Like it yeah. was modeled after totally. the recycler. You had all the, yeah. you know, started in the front with your home stuff. Yeah, and, and you worked your way through the different sections. Yeah. The automotive yeah. in the I feel back. like in a lot of states like Arizona, they have the what's called the white paper. The yeah. white. I always when I'm in Havasu, it's very similar to very what similar. we had here. And it, they're all because they're all gone. Craigslist ate them all. But uh, yeah, dude, that was the Bible. Every week you get yeah. the recycler and you look for whether it was a you're looking for a, a, a KX 125 dirt bike or Mountain you're looking bikes, for dirt or, bikes, yeah. whatever. Yeah. It was oh my and god, only so much 50% fun. Of the stuff in it was stolen. Yeah. And it was free. <laughs> like you could put your ad in for free once yeah. a week, and you'd have to call and put it, in. It have it renewed. Yeah. Yeah. So I had him do this whole full page ad, and that was there. And then it's like the Lambo and what we do, stereos, alarms. Cell phones and pagers. Phone rang off the hook. LA, what was it? Uh, Pac Bell and LA Cellular. Yep. Since we're a GTE mobile communications, we kind of went through them and got both. Yeah. Well, pa- then Pac Bell became singular, which became AT and T. Okay. So I have the same phone number from back when it was Pac Bell. Oh wow. Well, which one became Verizon? No, Verizon was separate. They were separate. Yeah, Verizon okay. was its own company, but okay. it was it was Pac Bell. We was like the first, well, they had analog cellular, but they were like the first to go to digital cellular and then they rebranded or got bought out and then it was singular and then AT&T bought up all singular and then it became AT&T, which it still is today. But yeah, I mean, back then, pack, I remember buying my first pager from Tommy Lasorda pagers <laughs> on Beach Boulevard and Golden West at the uh, 405. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> what? So you're hawking pagers now, and I want to get back to your story about the recycler, but what was it with pagers that everybody who rolled them was so cheese like, hey, bro, you want a pager? You want a pager? Hey, bro, bro, I got pagers. Like, what? Why? Why did that culture, like, grab the pager thing think, so hard? I think immigrants are hungry, right? They see why America's so great, and they capture onto something, right? And it's tech. It was tech at the time. Like... Most people, and I mean by most, is in like everyone you know in 1990 or one, 91 did not have a cell phone. Yeah, like, that, it didn't exist. I mean, yeah. they were giant Motorola bricks or they were tied to your car. They didn't the leave o- the car. Yeah, it was the Oki 21 that yeah. you can pull the thing and, and carry you have a case like a with you. Case, or yeah. you had the brick Motorola, right? Dude, yeah. 10 points for Oki. I haven't yeah, heard Oki. an Oki reference in forever. Yeah, and that, but that was the stuff, right? Yeah. But it was like a buck 10 a minute. During yeah, the hot ridiculous. hours and 70 cents a yeah. minute after. So the pager was so great because that's how you find your friends. Yeah. You page them and then they'd be like calling you, oh, I'm yeah. here. From a pay phone somewhere and, you know, hopefully you were at home where they could find you. But you obviously it got – so I had a friend and after uh, high school, he got some sort of an inheritance. It was like his – I think it was – it matured or whatever. And so he hit 18, so he got a bunch of money. So he moved out to Arizona and bought a pager store there. So I basically got this crazy lifetime pager subscription, but it was the the data pager that had like three lines of text. And I remember like when Princess Diana died, I remember my pager going off. And that's one of the first news stories I read was reading through my pager. That And, and I had people could call a call center 
leave you a text message. The call center would type it and then send it to your pager. Well, anyways, just to fast forward through it, the owner's Korean. He's reading his Korean newspaper, and we had this great relationship. Like, I could make fun of him. He'd make fun of me. And he he liked it because, oh, well, let me fast forward again. So I'm the install guy. I'm doing, like, you know, alarms. Uh, Viper alarms yep. are hot and, you know, the stereos and, like, Hondas, all the easy stuff. And um, I'm upstairs one day, ask him a question, but I'm watching him interact with a customer that's like, well, I want to do this and that, whatever. And he's like, oh, I could do this with these. And I'm like, oh, hold on. So, yeah, we sell these woofers and these two amps. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. Like, James wasn't really getting the high end. He's just getting the, like, stereo. The walking guy. Yeah. Head and two. Yeah, so. Head unit and two speakers. Yeah, and so I was, I, I'm like, what Camberg was to off-road, I was to stereo. I'm like, no, you're going to get amps and a preamp and we're going to do this right. And that's, he saw that and I went from like a $500 sale to like a $4,000 sale. So I immediately got put into sales. It was like, okay, you could do that. And James was stoked because he's a Korean dude. His English was broken. He didn't really get that end of it. Well, anyways, over time, he's like reading his Korean newspaper and now I cleaned up the ad. So I did that. That's why I'm there doing the ads in the magazine. And um, I'm like, let me see that magazine. And I'm looking at it. And he goes, you can't read that. I go, no, I know. I can't. I'm not Korean like you. I can't read this. <laughs> I wasn't like born there. Anyway, so I'm looking at it. I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. And he goes, what? What did I do now? And I'm like, tell me what's wrong with that magazine. He's still looking at me like a deer in headlights. I'm like, there's not one ad, not only for stereos, but for cell phones. And this is the LA Korean newspaper. He looked at me like, you're right. I'm an idiot. So he immediately put an ad in there. And the phone rang off the hook. Oh, I bet. Like, but no English, just yeah. Korean. I'm like, oh, hold, you know, hold yeah. on a second. <laughs> and uh, James would take all the calls. Immediately, he sold that shop to um, L.A. Sound. Oh yeah. They built like the Hermosa and the Malibu, all those different amps. So they bought it. I had the opportunity to go to L.A. and work with him, which would have been the forefront of cell phones and stuff. So in the hindsight, I'm like, oh, what would have I been doing in that world? You would have. Right? Yeah, you could have right? been a tech giant. Who knows? But uh, anyways, all good. I don't know. Stuff. You're living your you're living your best life. I think you're doing okay right now. I, I found. <laughs> I, I just followed my passion. Yeah. So so at some point you're transitioning from car audio to suspension, and and you had been toying with off road stuff this whole time. Yeah. So I had the stereo. I had the extra cab truck, and I'm doing that. And then my friends in school have the Downey off road catalog. You know, I didn't want a mini truck. I didn't want lowered. I wanted off-road tires. I wanted the four-wheel drive truck that I couldn't afford. And as I say, the Downey catalog was like the Toyota Bible for going oh, off-road. Everything, yeah. You yeah. could V6, Buick, swap All your sorts of whatever. Stuff. I've never heard of that. So Downey, Downey off-road. off-road. Downey off-road. It's yep. probably like a half-inch thick yep. catalog. Where were they based? Downey. Downey, Downey California? Yeah, no, okay. Santa, Santa Fe Springs. <laughs> I Santa bet it could Fe have Springs. been someone's last name. Telegraph. I don't know. They're on Telegraph Road. Yeah, okay. I know that because like, I would read it and go yeah. there many times. Yeah, so they had the catalog, they had the upper arms, the dual shock kits, the strut frames. It was all kind of like they would make it rad, and then they would just cheapen it up. It was kind of one of those, like, now what do you do? Like, I want it better than that. And um, so Jason and I were, like, going to the races. So, so Jason Campbell, yeah, you're Jason the other Campbell, half at Camberg. The Cam and Camberg, yeah. right? And, and you have to stop and tell us how do you know, you grew up with Jason or what's the story? Yeah, we went to junior high and high school together. Okay. Yeah, Dwyer, downtown Huntington yep. Beach and then Huntington Beach High School. and Oilers. Oilers. And what was his background? Um, Kind of the same. Like his dad worked in the oil fields, did welding. Jason had tools in the garage. His dad actually passed away uh, when he was younger, but he had all these tools in his garage. Um. And so, you know, he was able to do his thing, and I, I was trying to shape surfboards, and I had to make these metal racks to shape the surfboard on it. So I bought a chop saw and a stick welder, a Miller stick welder, and um, that's kind of how I learned to sort of weld. Like, no one really taught me. And um, then I went to OCC and then took the welding class and actually learned how to weld, which then you learn, like, still wasn't great at it, but I learned how to put the metal together properly. Didn't look penetration good. and yeah. heat, all that good so stuff. So how you do it the right way and the voltage and all that stuff. So then, yeah, so we did that. And Jason was a good fabricator. He worked at a place called BMP in Costa Mesa, which was like Bob's 
mobile performance or something. <laughs> I called it from hot rods to curtain rods because the dude would do anything <laughs> to make a buck. Um, but yeah, they did like Mike Ness's Pontiacs yeah. and did some cool hot rod stuff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's some pretty big stuff. Yeah, and they had like Brady Helm back in the day at Fabtech build them a um, Toyota race truck and then it wound up at BMP and got more legit from there. And then a few other, the, the Lorana 7S guys yeah. and stock mini guys back in the day. So Jason was a good fabricator, and he's kind of learning how to build things. He's way better at that part. And I actually approached Bob, and I said, hey, like, let me partner in this business, and let's start making products and do it. And his exact words are, oh, there's no money in off-road. And I'm, like, looking at Rancho and yeah. Fabtech and Autofab and all these guys. Yeah. Like, It's with- interesting to me, though, that you're looking at it through this a lens that I think many people don't. So you're going, like, I want to buy this stuff for me. But then you immediately go – hmm, wait a minute, there's a market, there's more of me out there. Well, it's that, but it's also like, I'm looking at what a real race truck has. And like, you can see the difference of the quality of fabrication and the beefiness of it and the shocks they're using. And then you look at the Downey catalog or the Fabtech thing or whatever, and it's all white shocks. It's like two two Gabriels as a dual shock kit. There's no performance or like, you know, I remember... Some companies be like, ooh, 70 30. Like James Dove had the 70 30 shocks, yeah. you know, back in the day. And, but they still weren't. And I, you look at, like, I remember that era, like the McPherson Chevrolet S10 yes. race truck that had the very first Bill Stein 8100 race shocks that were yellow. And it was two or three of them on the rear cage per side. And you're looking at these cylinders with like braided hose coming out of them. I and think like, they were actually 6100s back then. Maybe it might have been Because it was the 60 series. Yeah, oh, like yeah. 60, millimeter. 60 millimeter. Yeah. But that was like the first time I remember at like OC Auto Show, yes. McPherson, which was a big dealer. Definitely. Uh, they had it on display in the Chevy booth. And it was like the first time I ever had a chance to see like a Something race truck real. up close. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a big difference. So for me, it was like Downey had tube arms. They milled out the ball joints. They got more travel. And then they got away from that. And they did these like flame cut steel bent, welded together, like just garbage. Like the geometry was close-ish, but the part itself wasn't yeah, as strong or didn't look was, as good. Yeah, the geometry yeah. was good, but they just cheapened it up. And like, I think it was made overseas cheap. But again, this is, you're looking at it for you or you're looking like, oh, can I resell these? I want to have the legit product and no one sold it. You couldn't go buy you it. You had to go to a fab shop to get it. And then Custom it was astro- astronomical. And yeah. you're thinking, if I can mass produce something near that, yeah, if I people are going to pay for the quality. Yeah, we'll build it. Yeah. And then it'll be available. Yep. And so we used to do all TIG welded radius arms and Toyota upper arms. We made long travel kits. We did so on the Toyota trucks, the first Heim joint strut frame. And that went out to the race, beat everyone. And then I remember David Fabtech, then he came out with a Heim joint strut frame. And kind of our long travel kit was all shaped killer. We weren't a business yet. And then he came out with the Ivan Dan kit. Yeah. And it was just two by three square tubing cut. Um, little rod off of it. It worked. It was cool. Yeah. I actually had one of those kits and it got the job done, but it wasn't like what we wound up building. Yeah. And um, from there, like Ford's just took off. Like everything I beam was I-beam. where it is. Well, that's where John at Autofab basically, he became the I beam guy, right? He was the I beam yeah. guy. Yeah. And we actually had the conversation with And someone. remember the, all the two wheel drive beams? So there's two, an I beam. We kind of used both, but it was, the traction beam was the one that had the that was for a four wheel four drive, four, yeah. and I beam was for two wheel drive. But if you remember, the I beam always said, "Do not bend or heat or whatever was was cast into yes. the part because all the off road shots." But those were the cast beams, yeah. that had ball joints in an alignment cam, yep. where the prior generation were fixed ball joints. So you'd have you to bend them, it. yeah. You'd have to you bend, have bend it to align it, it. yeah. And uh, so they did that, and we would buy all the bent beams from Autofab. So like Fabtech and Camberg would buy all the pre-bent beams because Autofab had a jig. And then we would build the radius arms and the coil buckets. And mm-hmm. same thing, we had a dual shock bucket, but then we went to the single 2.5 inch yeah. shock. And at that time, 2.5 was a big ass shock. That's, yeah. I mean, that's like what a King Kong like four inch shock would be to yes. today's world, right? Like a, two and a half was, I mean, and they were, what were people racing on 33s back then? Yeah, all the Toyotas were pretty much like 33s, 32s and 33s. 35s were kind of like unheard of. Trophy trucks had 37s. Yeah. Class A trucks ran 35s. Like it was a big change. Yeah. What were the shocks? What what was the diameter of the piston back then? Two and a half. Two and a half was... No, no, but like like before the two and a half. Two two inch. inch. It was just, okay. Yeah, so you'd see buggies that have like five or six shocks on the back of them. And then it quickly went to like a 
couple, like a two and a half, and then it became yeah. a coil over. And then there was Custer Shocks, and that was a three inch, which was um, Custer Company in Long Beach built the like Walker Evans race shocks. Then they got called Custer Shocks. Then Sway Away bought Custer, and Brett and Lance King started King. But they were the engineers and the guys at Custer. Oh. So they basically didn't have the Custer job. For, I don't know the whole story behind okay. that one. But then they went out and started King when Sway Away had such a big head start. Uh, again, when you talk about California pompousness, that's because the whole, the, the literally the world of off road racing and those types of fab parts started right here oh, in the yeah. 90s. This, this was the epicenter of in, really the entire off-road industry today was the epicenter was right in Southern California, in Orange County. Do you attribute that to so many of the guys who were in that, they were in construction and in that era, the real estate market in Southern California was going bonkers. So there was money, well, I mean, right? There's... And so the guys that were even today, like some of the biggest off-road race teams are rooted in real estate, right? Construction, whatever. It was funny. Uh, my best friend had his 50th birthday party last night. And that feels really weird to say 50, right? Like that's right. Just, yeah, yeah please don't. Old. Um, but Mike Leslie is a good friend of him. And he owned the Jeep off-road race team, the Donna V team back in the day. Yep. And uh, he was there and we we're talking. He's like, you know, everyone says the first four-wheel drive trophy truck was in 2001. And he goes, I built the first four-wheel drive trophy truck in the late 80s. And it had a straight axle. And yeah. it won. And, and, so, and Donna V, which was another dealer in what, Placentia, Huge in off-road racing. Huge. But those guys, those guys dominated. Whenever you would see an ad or a race that had a Jeep off-road truck, it was always Donovy. Yeah, like it, it was such a weird name. Yeah, Class Three, Class Six, All of Trophy it. Truck. Kurt Leduc raced for him. Yeah. Um, and so Mike, Mike's been racing still, but in the UTV side of things now. But it's kind of interesting. So he has these videos, and I remember being at the fireworks race when they did this twenty-lap race on Friday, and uh, it was the most amazing thing I ever saw. This is where. And Barstow. So okay. the Fireworks 250, which was a score race. And that was uh, back in 1994. Was um, that? How, when did uh, KC and Best in the Desert start? It was somewhere around there, right? Like 92, 93, yeah, but something all, like that? only motorcycles. And oh. then it, it became trucks. So, yeah. Yeah. My first year with Best in the Desert was 2007. Yeah. And that was kind of when it was starting to gain popularity. It was this whole thing of, oh, you can't spectate, you know, Best in the Desert yeah. sucks. And you go there and you're like, wow, this is the Best yeah. place ever. And we used to do that. I remember uh, we were watching a Best in the Desert race. It was probably, oh, which race? It might have been, was it Barstow 250 or something like that? Uh, it was out at like Outlet Center or somewhere out there. And I had That just, would be the Fireworks 250. Maybe it was the Fireworks yeah. 250. So I was out there and this was like within the first few years of like stock minis. Uh, and 7S. Yeah. And I remember I had just gotten my new to me Ranger 4x4 and I was parked on the side of the uh, the race course and guys are going by all night. Me and a bunch of buddies are camped up there and we're sitting in our truck beds and a Ranger comes up over the rise, loses the front wheel. <gasps> the wheel bounces right through our group of trucks, hits nothing. And now the Ranger with no front wheel, no steering is now just grinding to a halt aimed right at my brand new to me truck. And stopped like three feet short. And I'm like, oh, wow. oh. I'm like, I just came here to watch. <laughs> Those are the days. Yeah, right? Just go out to the desert and hang out with your buddies and watch racers go by. Definitely, yeah. Awesome. I mean, it was just so much fun. And then, you know, that kind of went away and score went all Baja and Best in the Desert took the Nevada Desert and Parker. And um, we had Lorana for a while. Then that went to MDR. And then now yeah, we have yeah. more. So, I mean, you still go out there. I, I think more puts on such an amazing series. Where they do these like shorter lap, multiple lap races, so it's kind of fun to spectate. You don't have all these remote pits, so it makes it a lot easier, and it's more about the racing. And I love that because when you know the course and you're doing like you know eight laps or something, like you really see people moving. Like yes, yeah. they know the course. Yeah, it's fun. And then the you know the terrain exposes rocks and it creates challenges. So you got to read the yeah terrain. every every lap changes because of, yes. you know people are, you know. These things get chewed up or big rocks that were there before got moved and now they're in a place you weren't expecting them to Definitely. be. And yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes it a lot of fun. And you could drive from one spot to the other as you're spectating and it just yeah. makes it fun. So that way you can catch your buddy a couple times, you know, going yeah. through, which is always fun. So we got to go back. At what point does Camberg become a business and you're actually selling things where you're putting them in cardboard boxes and you're shipping them around the world? Yeah. So in 97, we started Camberg as the official business. And, um, you know, immediately, like, I went into the off-road magazine and I go, oh, there's Duffco. He's selling yep. Toyota stuff. Like, hey, we're making these Toyota arms. Here's your cost. And, you know, I came in and supplied him upper arms and a couple other people. 
bought little ads in the back of uh, off-road magazines, a little square and said like, you know, suspension systems and named it, send $2 for a catalog and a sticker. And uh, the catalog was like a little threefold thing and it just kind of showed. And people would call like, well, I want to do this or that. And we just ship them a kit. It was like all over the phone. And then we had a website that I built, um, an HTML site and had the whole FTP thing. And I made my life easy. I bought the Sony Mavica M91, which took a floppy disk in the side. Okay. So I can shoot photos and videos. And I had all that on the website. No one had a website. Yeah. Like Autofab's website was like you got a landing page. Yeah, it was it. basically just a landing page with that you had like, I don't know how to call it infinite scroll, but I mean, it just felt like it was scrolled through like an yeah. online version of a catalog. Yeah. So it was it a was picture so that was like low res and then like a bunch of words and the price. Yeah. So I had an HTML site with a top header, a left yeah. header, and then the main page and then just kind of created like little text images that you, you know, hyperlink and have the the link that you can hit. And it just said Toyota, you go to Toyota page and then there's like little squares with info. And, and that was the true, you know, social media before social yeah. media it was like that. And then we would have galleries of builds. So we just kept putting all this information out there. No other company had it. And then there was uh, extremeoffroad.com which was Klaus that started Race Desert. So yep. I helped Klaus and Paul start Race Desert with our Sony Mavica cameras, taking pictures and like little MPEG videos that were all choppy with the camera. <laughs> and But we had content up there. Sure. And it was just part of the infancy of it. And the only thing I told Klaus, I'm like, yeah, you know, just this photo gallery bought, brought by Camberg. And then I was able to post like, you know, builds we're doing yeah. and whatnot. And this went from the message board that was like one page. Yeah. And you had to scroll through it. So for those of you that don't know Race Desert, it's D-E-Z-E-R-T. Yeah. Right, yeah, and so it's that race became dash desert. Yeah, yeah, and this was like the early Bible for all things. Yeah, it was. It was. It was Southern pirate, pirate four by four before pirate four by four was a thing. It was the thing for the desert community. It was the first time people in really like Arizona and Texas and other places that had sort of deserty off road terrain actually had a chance to see what Baja and SoCal looked like. I mean, you'd hear stories, you'd see something in a magazine, but. To your point, that the MPEG videos and things like that, that was the first time you actually saw what suspension yeah. looked like moving over the whoops for a lot of people. Yeah, and there's a video you'll see at Laughlin when Jason Baldwin's hucking that road and landing on the back bumper, and you hear Paul's going, yeah, like just screaming. And that's such an iconic scene because this is late 90s, watching a trophy truck jump over the road. Yeah. But you're seeing it online like you know a few hours after it happened. And it's cool. It's kind of like what we have now with social media. So now there's just so much noise in every direction and the good stuff goes viral. Right. But yeah, race desert was all desert racing. And then pirate four by four was all the rock crawling yep. GP. You know, I kind of look at it as like one was off-road magazine. And, and one was four wheeler Peterson, Peterson four wheel yeah. And where, where did Camberg fit in? What was your lane? Oh, we were all more pre-runner yep. performance suspension. And I remember, you know, trying to get, um, oh, by the way, that's that's the palm and the, the fist, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. boom, yeah. I got yeah. a moment here. Yeah. Calling uh, Peterson for Will and Off-Road, I forget who the editor was, but yeah, let's do an article. Let me help you with this. Because they would talk about desert racing and just butcher it. And I'm like, no, that's not what it is, but let's do this. And we would always get the... I wonder if it was Cole back then or Cole Quinnell maybe. Or... I don't remember. But it was bad. It was like, dude, you're like the legit magazine and you're like, what? like you're straight axle 1988 four by Chevy still. Like, come yeah. on, get with the times. And then we had Off-Road, off-road Magazine. Off-Road was more the deserty scene. and Yeah, Rick Shanley was there at the time and he got it sort of. Man, like, there's a name I haven't heard in a million years. Yeah, such a cool dude. And uh, yeah, we had him and then, you know, as the years went on, we had like Kevin Bloomer. Yeah, Bloomer was there. Finnegan was there. Yeah, Finnegan was like on Truckin' or something, right? He or was what? on Truckin' and when I went to Truckin', I replaced, it might have been Jeremy Cook or one of those guys when I started. Jeremy and, Cook, he grew up yeah. here in Huntington Beach too. Yeah, he's a LBC guy now. Okay. Um, yeah, he worked with him for a long time and uh, then Finnegan went from, I think, Truckin, and he might have been working on off-road. So before the TV stuff and the video stuff, he was uh, off-road and then became the editor of Off-Road Magazine before he moved to, I guess, doing road killings. Oh, I guess Hot Rod with Freiburger. Yeah. And then they started doing the YouTube deal, which ended up being Roadkill. But yeah, I mean, I remember we used to, you know, Finnegan and I worked at the same time when I was at Truckin, and he was at Off-Road. 
uh, we worked in the Anaheim office, and there's like one of those little Greek hamburger deals on the corner, you yeah. know, a greasy burger with a you know the the shake or the the soda cup that had like you know the the Greek writing on the side that you get it like SoCal was like every corner had one of those charbroiled burger places. Well, like Steve's charbroiled. Star- exactly. That's like a Greek Steve. family. That's ex- yeah. that was our. Well, yeah. was they, and they have numbers know. too because there's so yeah. many. It's like it's Tom's no, number, number seven. two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's like Steve's it's number two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this reminds me of the old magazine days when we we were all starting out as magazine people in the late '90s and the early 2000s. And, and I really, like, I was talking to someone about this this morning. Um, I don't know if you go to Quarantine Cruise, but there's, you know, Matt Black Unicorn on Instagram. But anyways, he's got this bitch in 55, 6, I don't know what year it is, but, like, shiny black, Matt Black mixed, like, killer car, LS swapped, whatever. But he worked for Hurley, so we're talking, like, surfing. And there was a mystique, right? Because the only spot you get seen surfing is either in a DVD or a VHS tape yeah. or the magazine. Well, yep. now everyone's got Instagram. So now you're like top surfer in the world who could be like number eight in the world. Like unless he's on his social page, like showing stuff. Like, he doesn't like, matter. He doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you take another guy like a Jamie O'Brien and he's on the North Shore of Oahu just having fun, like surfing on soft tops. And he's got a million followers. He, he's making the money now. Yeah. Because right? he's like his own magazine. So we used to tell the magazines like, man, you got – you know, 15 off-road magazines now, and Camberg doesn't have a budget to put 15 $10,000 full-page ads out there. Yeah. So why aren't why aren't you condensing these? Instead, they just keep adding more and more and more. No, it's because they kept buying companies that had their own, and they didn't get rid of any of them. And yeah. I mean, I could go back through my last 20 years and show you, okay, well, this should have happened here, and this should have happened, and this should have happened. But What was the first big order that Camberg had where you sat back in your chair and said, Jason, I think we made it. Or was there not a, a moment like that? I would say that came like way later. Okay. We got some massive UAE order that was like, it was going on for like two, three years of quoting. And finally the guy came in the office one day and I'm like, literally like whatever when he walks in and he goes, hey, I got to talk about another thing. And I'm like, it's been going on for a couple of years. Like they bought some samples. They were like, you know, should we do a Raptor or a Tundra? Poop or get off the pot, dude. Yeah. But you I mean, say UAE, United Arab Emirates? Yes. Correct. Okay. And so I was like, you know, the D- Dubai, when you think of that kind of area. And he goes, all right, they're ready to go. Uh, what kind of deposit do you need? And I'm like, well, we need at least half. And we're talking like a massive order. We're because talking- this is going to be build to order, basically. Right? Yeah. So we're going to do all the parts for 425 Toyota Tundra trucks. So you're Holy talking- crap. Is this military? It's like defense there. So it's like their border patrol, right? Okay. So, all right. So imagine like 425 long travel kits, the coilovers, the front bypass shocks, the rear air bumps, the rear bypass shocks. We made this um, under the bed shock relocation kit. All the Deaver Springs, all the wheels, which is 2,125 beadlock wheels. It's a huge order. And it was like he slides a $2 million check across the table. Like, is you know that enough for a deposit? I'm like, well, yeah, it's plenty for a deposit, but we need half. And that's not close to half of what yeah. this order is. But it's, it's a good start. We'll get moving. And so I just kind of played it like, okay, we've done all this work for a few years yeah. quoting this. No matter time what, time to get paid. Yeah, we're gonna build all the Camberg stuff first. Yep. Because then we make money. Yep. And then all the shocks and wheels and all yeah, that stuff. All the third stuff party vendor stuff will come later. Yeah. And so I'm like, even if. Assume, hopefully they can supply. Yeah. And, right. and that's not on me because I'm telling them, like, you know, they need this much time. Yeah. So if you don't get me the more money, then you don't They're, get your shocks. You yeah. can figure that out on your own. Here's your specs, yeah. right? Yep. Because the margin's slim on the parts. Yeah. Plus but, shipping. And they handle that. Oh, so like, even better. So he has a company, the guy I dealt with has a company here in Orange County, and he he does like all this crazy business. Like they take shipping containers and make them shooting ranges. Nice. And mm. then they do- well, that, that might be the next thing to add in my backyard. <laughs> I'm looking out the window here and I'm thinking I got space. You, you have enough room yeah. for about 20 yards? Uh, yeah. Oh, I have 20 yards for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll make that happen. Well, I mean, you could take up the whole backyard and go <laughs> 50 yards. <laughs> but um, no, it was, it was pretty wild. So- that was like the big moment, right? And that was like, okay, now we held on to this profit and we were going to make moves. And this was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 or whatever year it was. And we just always kind of saved and business from there. Like I got to reinvest and we had more inventory, hired some more people and just kind of held on to that profit and um, just kind of grew the business. So we went from doing one amount per year to doubling it to then doubling that. Every year. And um, 
that was kind of a defining moment on like real business and able to inventory so we weren't losing that um hey do you have it in stock no i could have it in a week and then lose the sale to now like yeah we have it right now we'll ship it out so that was a big one there are a lot of companies that build to order that don't realize that how much business they're losing by not having stuff on the uh, product on the shelves yeah and and i mean even camberg like how we're organizing things right now but i mean it's just like so the big news yeah, get into this. So, yeah, are you, are you now? Forward. Are you uh, Magnaflows, Jerry uh, from yeah. Camberg? Yeah, uh, you know the news is public; it's out yeah. there. But uh, Camberg was acquired by Magnaflow at the end of uh, last year. Which obviously so. the family at Magnaflow is making exhaust products for internal combustion engines, and so they were looking for ways to diversify their portfolio of brands so that they would have, you know, they would insulate themselves from any changes that maybe or could be coming into you know aftermarket exhaust and things like that and yeah so suspension's a big one and and when you look at the off-road truck suspension world there's some companies out there that do some massive numbers Mm -hmm. and so it's just knowing like what level to make and then what can we push with that so i think it's going to be you know when you look at suv and you look at the military stuff we've done in the past for the u.s military we've done special ops on like land cruiser hilux prado um, and then we help, you know, other countries with their stuff and then the distributorship out of here. So like a lot of customers that are out there in like Saudi Arabia and Dubai and uh, South America, Australia, there's a lot of product being sucked up and we have the resources so we can design the product for the right vehicles. So like Land Cruiser 300 comes out. They don't have that in the United States, but we already have full kits and long travel kits for those. And I'm talking like game changing quality stuff that we have for that, that we're redoing Tacoma and Tundra now, mm. and then getting into, you know, the F-150 and like we've heavily neglected Silverado because we've just been so busy with yeah. what we have. And we only have some, we have three buildings, but we're blowing out the doors. Like we have no more room. So now we're looking for a way bigger building to outfit that. And uh, we get a lot of questions um, like, oh, so what does this mean? Like, is Magnaflow going to make your product? No, that's not how that's going to work. Um, what people don't understand about Magnaflow is Magnaflow is a performance exhaust company, but they're also like OE exhaust yeah. and catalytic converters. And they have mag- a huge catalytic converter and, business. And honestly, a great marketing company. Oh, it's an amazing marketing company. Like that's, I mean, their their name is is massive in the automotive aftermarket. Yeah, and there's no one in exhaust touching them. Like the quality, the engineering. When you really see what goes behind what they do, yeah. But we're gaining all that. So they have that part of it. They have ocean side. They've got room for some some manufacturing, right? I mean, they're expanding and they're building some sort of a. Uh, you know, new machines and some new floor space so that you guys will have those as resources for overflow and things like that. So the obvious question that everyone's saying, it's like, all right, look, we're going electrified, right? We're not going to need catalytic converters and exhaust systems in the future. Is Camberg their future? Because no, cars no. and trucks will always need suspension. They I, won't I always think, need no. exhaust tapestry. systems. When it's you tapestry. do the research on combustion engine yeah. and all that, like combustion engines aren't going away. No. Right? There's a heavy push right now for EV. But let's just really look but, at but that's, it. That's true. They're not going – They are, but they're going to slow. The percentages will go down. And if, if a Magnaflow or any exhaust company is expecting to increase sales every year, that's not going to work anymore. Well, the sales will flatten. And and so you, your sales are going up. You've got great hockey stick growth, you know, flat and then boom through the clouds. And they're looking at correct. that. Suspension's definitely yeah. going to, like Camberg's going to go up for sure. Like the numbers we do versus the numbers some of these big suspension companies do. Like we have a lot of room to go yeah, You guys have a, 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 the opportunity, I think, for a, for a quality part, especially if you can mass produce in larger numbers to bring your costs down and still provide that quality part and that and engineering even, that you guys do is But I don't amazing. even think it's about the cost, right? Because like you can't buy a Raptor or a Raptor R or a Bronco or a yeah. Bronco R or a TRA. Like yeah. you can't buy any of those and it's not about the money. Right. It's about the demand. So people want quality. Um, and we know how to mix that value with quality. Mm-hmm. Like it's not about cheap or what can I do for less. It's about how can I mix up these really high quality parts well, you can make what they really want. You can make a component that is as tough of a, as a race component, but more durable than a race component for a street truck that's engineered, but also designed to be pretty and is anodized and looks Correct. nice on your 
on your and car. And that's what your, we did yeah. with the billet aluminum upper A-arms. Exactly what I was going for. We did that back in like 98, yeah. 99. So on now Chevy's. it's eye candy and it's functional and Correct. it's tougher than stock. Correct. All those things, right? Like you guys have done a good job of finding that intersection between engineering and design and I would say desirability and cost where you're kind of in that place, that sweet spot where you, again, you have that great looking product that's, that, that feels race because you guys have proven the durability on them on the race course. Correct. But looks good enough to be a piece of jewelry on your car, no different than getting an anodized set of wheels or brake calipers or whatever, where it's kind of a wow factor. Correct. And you're giving them the function that goes behind it, where it's not just something that is, you know, great, great engineering, but looks horrible on my truck, right? You have that sweet spot of camber. Well, I look at it like this, is like, we're the Louis Vuitton of off-road. We're not the cheapest. There's Michael Kors. There's... I don't know what other brand handbags your wives could buy, but you know Jane's been buying not stuff. Not Coach, because my wife <laughs> no. will not will not. Uh, she won't rock, rock a Coach. Well, nope. that's what I'm she saying. So she uh, does she do Burberry? Does she do yeah. uh, what's the Dove or the 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 bird? The fat bird. What's that? It's not uh, the, f- the fat bird. The fat bird. Sure, that one. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, you go to South Coast Plaza Mall in yep. Orange mm-hmm. County. This Orange County. That's thing where now. the rich kids hang out. Well, Louis Vuitton has a line out the door. Yeah. Chanel has a line out the door, and I'm not Prada. talking like a little line. Yeah. Right? yeah no, like Gucci lines. has a line out the door. So if I'm going to be a suspension company, I don't want to be the Michael Kors or the Coach that has no line out the door or security guy at the door because yeah. no one's buying it. They're buying, they're selling way more bags because you go online, you go to Macy's, everywhere. Like they're selling tons of It's not of desirable it. if you can get it easily too. So I'd rather be less volume, high yeah. end, legit, and then just is, check is off. Is Magnaflow going to allow that? Are, they, are you guys but, aligned with philosophy? that's what they are in the yeah. exhaust world. So like there's cheaper exhaust companies, yeah. right? And to, and to Jay's point, I mean, asking if Camber is the future, I think it's part of the future, it's but part of the future. they're looking at other acquisitions. This well, is what just was the their first Okay, so many. hold on. So over the last five years, I'm like, hey, we got a new Banks exhaust for your truck. He's like, we can't. I'm a Magnaflow guy. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And every time he gets a new truck, I pitch it. It's like, nope, still a Magnaflow guy. Yep. Which now he's really a Magnaflow himself. guy. Now he's really a Magnaflow guy. What is their sales pitch to you, though? So you're, how does this all go down? I don't know if you – don't tell us the money, but tell us how the dynamics – did they take you out to breakfast? Were you at a race? No, did we, you go to an Angels had, game? No, we had um, – you know, for the last five years, people interested in buying Camberg and – most companies, when they buy a company, they go, okay, well, what is your number? How does What's the EBITDA yeah. of this we'll thing? Give we'll give you multiples of X. Yeah, and so it's like, well, that's cool if I'm a yogurt shop on yeah. the corner and I'm not a brand. Or if I even want to sell, but I love what I do. Correct. And so, you know, we've had a few. And those guys, you can see in modern times, have bought other suspension companies and you're already seeing those brands on yeah. sale. Like, they're looking at it wrong. Yeah. And then we were between a couple good companies. There's another really good company and six months of dealing with them. And I'm like, look, guys, like, I don't care what you think the number is, but I don't want to just take a check and walk away. I want to be here and grow and make this more radical. It's, need- it's after all, it's your name. This yeah. is not like A1 performance. This has got your name in it. it. It does, but... In your DNA. But it's more of the, like, we can't get it any bigger now that rent's $2 a square foot and you need yeah. insurance and benefits and your huh. employees need to be taken care of. But if I can sell it, get paid well, and these guys are going to pump it with what it needs to build radical off-road parts and we're all happy, then this is going to be great and fun. And that's kind of what... Magnaflow is about. And if you look at what they do, who their ambassadors are, the products they make, what they give back at SEMA to everybody, sure. they put on a show. It's not yeah. about just making money. They love what they do. And when you look at the um, the Pallones, that's the family, yep. Jerry Pallone, like how he started the company, he came from Canada with nothing, literally, his family, and that was it, and started a business. Nick Pallone, the, you know, they, they started in catalytic converters, and it was like you know, recycling. And back then the materials weren't the same as what they are now, but their hands got dirty. They lived, I couldn't even imagine what they look like leaving their shop in the beginning. Yeah. Like they worked really hard to, to get where they are today. And they are like Jerry Pallone's like, he already made his money. He's like, this is exciting. I feel like I'm young again. Yeah, like, getting re-energized. Yeah. And it was so, so cool to see this guy. Like he walked into our machine shop and he's like, yo, oh, you could just see him. And then um, Dan Pallone was like, oh, the two Jerry's are dangerous because we like machinery. Yeah. Like we want 
state of the art CNC like, just 400 like, axis CNC machine. Well, ah! Seriously, and that's that's <laughs> like where they're at. Like they're two benders. They're not just two benders. Yeah. They're like the benders. Yeah. And everything they do is just radical like that. So um, they have this massive like they they don't want to make things over in China that they like refuse to do it. Um, but they've been making some stuff in Mexico, like right across the border. It's the future for America. Is like we'll probably wind up owning Mexico one day. Would be my guess. But they have a four hundred seventy-five thousand square foot facility that they're doing in Mexico wow. right now. So that's where I bet you like OE and catalytic converter happens. Well, they have four hundred thousand plus square feet in Oceanside, California, and that's where I can see some of Camberg's manufacturing going. Like mm-hmm. multiple machines, we're making billet arms, all that kind of stuff. And this is just speculation. Um, But it would make sense. And then Camberg in Orange County is going to be the, you know. Design center or something? Exactly. So just imagine like what we feel like when we walk into Bass Pro Shops for the first time and you're like, whoa. like Disneyland of of outdoors. Or or it'll be like, you know, OE's manufacturing factory is going to be in the Midwest somewhere. But they have design centers in the cool place, usually Southern California or whatever. Imagine like when you come to Camberg now, like we don't have like 10 lifts along a wall. Right, yeah, yeah. Like. My vision is So are that. you going to leave your location? Because you do have three buildings stacked really close to each other yes. with a narrow driveway, and you have to know where you are if you're a customer to go find you. Are you guys trying to find something that's more customer-facing? Because right now, you guys have a great location and a great spot, but it's great as a manufacturer in the background. It's not yeah. great as a customer-first type of experience. Ideally, we're going to have like the like there will not be something like what we're going to do in the United States. Awesome. Or the world. Are you going to try and stay in HB or? The, the goal's HB. My radius is 405.55 area. Okay. So yeah. maybe Santa Ana yeah, over yeah. there. Close along to Mesa, the, yeah. Santa Ana, northern of Newport. That, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the problem space. Like everything yeah. in Huntington Beach, we used to have bigger buildings. And now yeah. it's all this high-density housing crap. Yeah. They're like getting rid of. Well, they're building a lot of stuff where Boeing used to be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of really interesting stuff. Amazon's distribution center's up there. Yeah. Uh, although I heard the uh, Herps are moving from their spot. They found a new spot because the owner of the building, yeah, I like guess, is. That building, because yeah. they sold it. If that was yeah. on the market today, that, that would probably, be perfect. That that would be what they would buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So have the Palomes said, Jerry, we need you on board for X number of years to guide the company, you and Jason, of course. Or did they say, this is the sales stick around as long as you want, and do you have a non-compete because you could sell and go start another one? Yeah, I mean, it's basically all of the above, right? Like, right now, it's like I, I've shifted from, you know, worrying about HR and all these other things to, like, now I'm – on path with the passion again. So like now it's, I have a laptop, like you guys have MacBook Pros. I got a MacBook Pro. Now I work off a laptop and I have teams and we have meetings and, but it's just way more strategy, which is what I love. It reminds me of like setting up like all the pit strategy to go down to a Baja race. So you're not as concerned now with where are we going to get band clamps? You're like, no. oh, my God, because seriously, how are we out of band clamps again? Who's not doing projections? So that's now you're yeah, elevated above yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not, like, talking to the welding gas <laughs> guy negotiating gas prices. Gas rates. Right. Okay. I'm not dealing with. Jimmy said something stupid in the shop that a customer overheard, and you're like, oh, Jimmy, get back in here. Yeah. So, I mean, we have a good crew of people. And Why it is it always Jimmy? I don't know. He's just a dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let seems... go of that Jimmy guy. <laughs> yeah, don't Jerry rig that. <laughs> so, no, so it's just really good. And, you know, it's just strategizing, going to more events, um, getting to do like real marketing with budget you know they get it they have they have the I budget. mean you guys have obviously had a successful business but you put a lot of money back in the business and when you go out to shows and stuff a lot of times it's it's sort of like the ones that you want to be at for whatever reason whether it's you know off-road expo and you guys bring the big trailer and you have a big booth or dabbling in overland expo west where you don't have a trailer you just have a couple trucks and some you know stands with some product and you're kind of feeling out do you guys understand like the dirty little secret of high-end suspension is the slow stuff can't go fast but the fast stuff can still go slow and give you a much better ride now you're working your way into other niches within the off-road community that you maybe haven't had a chance to explore before well we've done yeah we've been everywhere we just haven't had a booth at sema yeah which we will have now awesome but we've been at overland west of I don't know, three or four different years. We've been at Off-Road Expo and Sandsport Show, all yep. that stuff. Now we're not going to just do Overland West Flagstaff. We're going to do also Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And then we'll have a booth. So, like, we'll have 20 by 40, and the Magnaflow will be right next to us, 20 yep. by 40. So we're, like, combined now. What is your number one – what is Camberg's number one product, and has that changed 
over the last couple of years and why? There's really not a number one product. I mean, we do a lot of suspension. Uh, we do a lot of, you know, these rear ends and billet hubs. Um, we just, our number one off-road product is we build really high-end off-road suspension. We don't really have a lot of people doing the way we do it. Well, I guess I'm asking, is it is it Raptor? Is it, is what, it Tacoma? What, what platforms are uh, so your Tacomas, bread butter? Tacomas, Tundras, Raptors, Silverados are the popular, right? And then your Forerunners and FJs and all that kind of mix into it. Right now, it's really tough because it's really hard to get shocks. Yeah. Right? So like Shocks are way out. And, yeah. and, 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 and they have been for like a year and a half. And I want to yeah, touch on no King, sense. too. You're a big King house as well, right? No, we're a big Fox. We're Fox. all Fox. Yeah. But what you well, see- didn't you, do, didn't you do King, King for he's a long done time? Every, he's done everything we over the years. We sell them all. Yeah. Okay. So we, we started off with trying to be direct with Fox day one, and we weren't cool enough at the time. And so then we called Bill Steen and Larry Ecker came by when we were like first unit, nothing yep. really in the building yet. And he's like, here's your band. I remember Larry's retirement party. That dude is awesome. I yeah, love he Larry, was great. man. He's a great he dude. Was great. Yeah. And so we were Bill Steen from the beginning, raced on Bill Steen up to like 06. And then 07 comes along and we got Blackhawks on the um, Ranger Edge. We raced in Best in the Desert as our first professional year. We tried to be with Fox then, and still, for the second time, no, you can't be direct. you got to go buy it from either Penn Hall or McKenzie's or something. But keep in mind, we're buying the big stuff, not the 2.0 yeah. stuff. Even in 2007, it's like that's our argument. So we're still with um, Bill Steen doing that. And then it comes now, we're, we're cool because we're going to race a trophy truck. And that's when Fox like said, okay, you can be direct with us and – we started putting shocks on trophy trucks and building those, and we raced our own things. So we were Fox ever since then. It was like our main thing. At the time, it's supply. Like, who are you partnering yeah. with? What's kind of the cool brand? What's building the quality? Who's pushing And the cool forward? brands changed over time. Obviously, Bill Stein, Sway Away, Fox, Correct. King. I mean, there's an ebb and flow. Now, there's some that have been consistently good in quality throughout. There's others that have had been really high quality, got bought and dropped. There's yes. others that have kind of come up into their own. And then there's some that came up, hit it hard, and couldn't keep up, and then fell off Correct. the face. I mean, and it's, that was your Sway Away, right? Yeah, like, right. So we were with them for a long time, and then that's when we switched to racing on Bill's we, from Some of the, the best shocks. When you guys were doing torsion bar stuff, you could get Sway Away torsion bars and the Sway Away shocks for your kids. I yeah. had those uh, on my first dually, and yeah. they were, no, before the dually, it was in, back in 03, had them. Best shocks I had had up to that point. Yeah, and they were great just shocks. Absolutely, the, and then all of a sudden, the company just falls apart. Yeah, I mean, they just... They got too excited about, like, let's make a five-inch coilover. Like, why? Like, no one's buying those. Oh, well, Baldwin Racing's going to run them. Well, yeah, for one truck. One and, truck. Yeah. Like, we, we here we, like, need, like, 100 sets of yeah. F-150 Chevy and Toyota 2.5 coilovers. Well, we used to approach Fox, and they're like, oh, we'll never make shocks that go on a street truck. Well, lo and behold. Lo and behold, yeah. we finally got our way, and now yeah. they're like a billion-dollar-plus-year company, yeah. right? And then they come Well, then you've got all the you know uh, QA1s. You've got Elka. You've got Radflow. You've got kind of these, I don't know, uh, sort of on the on the fringes of off-road, but well, also in their own in their own right, they have their own niches. Correct. And I, I think like Elka makes good stuff. Yeah. All of that aside, we've just taken a stance now with the Magnaflow side and something that I've wanted to do for a number of years, like, okay, we could be sponsored by one shock brand, but we sell a ton of these other ones, but we we never talk about them. Yeah. And you can't get the ones that you might be sponsored by. Correct. Is and another problem. A big, big problem. So yeah. it's hard because we need shocks for the Raptor R. We need shocks for our new Tundra. We need... Yeah. So last year's SEMO is a big eye-opener where... You know, Ramsey's a king calls and goes, hey, you know, we're putting a Tundra in our booth and we need your billet arms and blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I go to SEMA and there's this Tundra with Camberg arms with king down the side of it, all on king shocks in their main booth. That does wonders for Camberg. Yeah. And then you go to the Fox booth, and it's like they're pimping all their own brands. Right. And it's like, mm. well, this yeah, is – because they bought BDS and JKS and all these other brands. Yeah. And, and, and we love the product. Yeah. We love the people. We sell the product. It's just yeah. so hard to get the product. Yeah. And it's like I have to stay afloat. Well, and of course, they're supplying their own in-house brands first before they're supplying guys like you. Who it are, definitely appears that way. You yeah. go to King of the Hammers, and it's like yeah. their whole booth is full of that stuff. But yeah. It used to be the Camber right. mixed with some of the sure. other brands they work with, and that's what made Fox so great. Yeah. And it is a good product, you know, and it's just hard because you're like, you know, how can you not have 
the Bronco shocks or yeah, how can right. you not have the Raptor R? Like you've had the blueprints for this forever. Yeah. Or a smooth body 2.0, not even talking about a big shock with a giant reservoir and Yeah, and but adjustment. our business needs that yeah. too. Like, hey, I just got an F-150. Yeah, somebody wants to lift it. Yeah. I, I can't get Fox for a year. Yeah. So we're selling King. Uh, we're talking to Elka now. So for me, I'm just taking a different stance where we're going to be more Switzerland on the yeah. shock brands. Yeah. They're all good shocks. And um, same thing. Are they? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I yeah. think okay. shock, shock technology outside Multimatic is pretty much the same. It really comes down to your wear seals and your dust seals, things like that, how often they need to be maintained, how often they wear, and then the person tuning them. You yeah, know? I mean, I think that's the biggest part of it. And so I, I feel like King and Fox are these top brands right now. And then you got your Elka who makes really high quality What's the other one, Falcon? Well, Falcon is More a Jeep. brand of Teraflex, and oh, okay. yeah, that's a that's a Jeep thing, of course. You know, Bill Stein and yeah, Bill Stein makes great stuff. Yep. So it just kind of comes back to like we need shocks to put in our kits. Yep. And we're not in the shock business, right? That's not like that's a whole nother undertaking. That that's not. Even and I'm really, sure you've yeah. considered it. No, it's not really on the radar. Really? No, I mean, you, you that's a under- whole completely other business. Like you can't really do a. A, a shock division, you have to have a completely other business to supply shocks. You well, you can see and... other brands, right? Let's not, I'm not naming brands, but they make <laughs> shocks, they make suspension components, and it, it's anodized and has a can and it does its thing, but it's not the same level. Like, yeah. there's internal parts you don't see. Yeah. And if you rip the shock apart and you really look you closely, can, you can see the there's difference. a huge difference. Wow. And I'm talking like plastic dividers in a reservoir yeah. versus aluminum, the type of seal Viton yeah. versus regular O-ring, right? Like, Or even like on your TRX shocks, you know, Bill Stein has a seal that as it wears, tightens up to keep dust and stuff and dirt out of it, which is why you don't have to rebuild those shocks yeah. every 30,000 miles. And that's the quality of like, yeah. you know, there's the shaft guide, right? So it's mm-hmm. a DU bushing, right? So it's the material that the shaft rides on and supports. It's the thickness of those products. So like... The cheaper shocks get thinner on the seal cap and thinner on the piston and thinner on the... So there's a lot of stiction and a lot of bad stuff. And when you look at the quality shocks, and this is when you look at like Fox and King and Bilstein, they all have really good wear bands around yeah. the piston and the type of uh, seals and pre-seals and wiper seals that they yeah, it's use. It's not the function that sets them apart necessarily. It's the components that make the shock function and the durability and, and longevity the get out of it. And function smokes yeah. the other guys, right? Yeah. So there's there's brands out there that make upper arms and they make yeah. shocks and all that stuff. And then you never hear a lot of good. It's like, oh, buy this. You know, they're big in the overland world. And then people buy it and they're like, it just kind of rides stiff. Yeah. And it's because it doesn't have the back end of it, right? Yeah. And um, for us, we just need to be supplied products. So for us, it's like, you know, we're taking more of a stance with like, you know, Fox, King, Bilstein, and a little bit of Elka is going to come in the door. And that'll be what we're doing. And then once Fox or King or one of those guys supplies us better, and then yeah. that'll be the main brand. Yeah. Um, it's just been Fox has been our main brand for a long time because they make really good stuff. But at the same time, you know, when you look at a Raptor and they got away from the external bypass yeah. shocks that we're screaming that we want, they're right. like, well, one of our dealers is complaining about the noise. And I'm like, yeah. well, we want them to work. Yeah. Like, I don't care about the noise. My customer wants them to work. Yeah, the internal bypass for me, I've never been a huge fan. Part of it for me is on internal bypass shock, it's not a monotube anymore because it's a sleeve within a sleeve. So you lose that heat dissipation through well, there. It's, it's more of the, the piston size. Like well, and the piston looks... size is way smaller than the body Correct. size, which isn't the case on a monotube. And so Fox changed the world on shock marketing by doing all about body size because their piston is so much smaller because the internal bypass has that sleeve. And then yeah. the other thing is, Internal bypass, you sort of tune for a zone. And if you look at an internal bypass on a shock dyno, it's pretty much ramps in a linear angle. So you tune for where you want it to be. And then everywhere else, it sort of is what it is. Whereas another shock, you a traditional shock, you can kind of tune it to have different zones where it does something a little bit better, where the shock well, dyno you, doesn't look like a straight line. Yeah, but when you do internal bypass correctly, because we've built them. Yeah, you've raced on them and stuff. Yeah. Believe me, they're really good and they have their place. Yeah. But when you can just stick in an external bypass. So my whole thing on the rear of a truck is, okay, I, I got it every day for street. There's nothing yeah. in the bed. I could open yeah, up Yeah, you the want tubes. the adjustability yeah. for the user because there's not that internal bypass. Yeah, it's just is and, what and it is. And perfect example is most shocks from the factory don't have enough rebound control. Correct. Because they are made to have to still work with load in the bed, and which slows it down. And that's the biggest problem with Tacoma, every, for sure. Well, I'm saying Contra- Raptor, yeah. TRX, Raptor. All, all these high-end trucks yeah. that come from the factory, yeah. like I go use off-road. They're never enough rebound for me. They're and bouncy. what happens is they're bouncy and they pogo or you yeah. slam the jounces and it sends the rear 
rear up, Correct. which upsets the front. And a lot of times, because the front weight stays the same, usually all these trucks are really dialed from the factory on the front. And for me, I, I would rather have a smooth body dialed for the front and a bypass for the rear because then I can adjust for weight and yeah. I don't have to, you know, you could tell a difference going over whoops or out in the desert. When your rebound is is can slow that axle down and your your vehicle can conform to the whoops, you're not getting air under your rear axle because it's Correct. not slamming back and forth. And that's where, to me, an external bypass wins is the rear of a pickup truck. And, and it comes back down to design. So, you know, we're out there doing the – we call it overlanding. Now we call it pre-landing because we're doing, you know, bed I call it gover-landing. There you go. <laughs> love it. Go fast. Yeah. So, you know, you put – 400 pounds in the bed of the truck, you don't realize like you're cooler and sleeping gear and your buddy yep. with you and all the stuff, but you got 400 pounds back there. It's going to bottom out easier. Yep. And it's more weight that's strapped out when you bottom out. Now it's trying to go the other, go dire- the other yeah. direction. So you need to crank in some rebound, yep. crank in some compression. You're good to go. But you can't and, do that uh, on internal bypass. You're you're stuck. So now you're just huh. bouncing all over the place. And you explain that to Fox. Like, look, my customers yeah. are high end. We need this. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, we're getting feedback of the noise it makes. And it's but like, whatever it's, you know, and the noise is basically just a clicking as the pistons going through the yeah. re- relief ports, which isn't that after, you know, I mean, it, you really, it's not it. that loud. You get used to it. Yeah. It's not a big deal. But what really comes down to like, it's just money, dollars yeah. and cents. For and them. by the like, way, internal bypass click too. They're yeah. just quieter. Well, it depends on how yeah. they're designed. But yeah, it's you're, you're right. If you go to Foxo and say, I'm going to buy 5,000 sets, they're going to build them Then they'll you. do it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, let's be real. Like I, you know, I'd be shocked if they made 250 sets for a Raptor. I bet you like say 500 sets. Really? Well, because the Raptor owner has been told by Ford that they already have a premium shock on yeah. it. So they're not necessarily, it's going to be that niche performance guy who knows what the Raptor is and yeah. is looking at it as a foundational platform. Who wants the better shock? But for the average consumer, it's the Louis Vuitton customer. Yeah, yeah. for the average consumer, that's not going to go out to the desert or <laughs> might just go with his buddies every once in a while. He's not going to need a bigger shock or even think about it. And you know, live valve's okay. It's it's got you know adjustability on the compression stroke. And so for what that dude's doing, and when he it's going to feel really good, and he's probably driving thirty miles an hour, forty miles an hour. But for Jerry's customer, he might be driving 65, 70 miles well, an not, hour. It's not even that. It's like live valve. And all this other valving they're doing, all they're doing is controlling the flow of the oil from, from the, the reservoir body to the reservoir, yeah. which is a big no-no. Like, that's not how we do it in yeah. off-road racing. Well, how's it different? Well, they're just choking down the reservoir. So, like, all that flow we've been talking about is now just choked down. So, it's going to create cavitation, all kinds of yeah. other issues. It's great for the guy that's going down a dirt trail that basically, like, he can, like, press a button and it stiffens it up and he's not bottoming out as easy. It does have its yeah. place, but it's going to build a lot of heat. It's not the valving through the piston as much as it is, you know, that shock body is full of oil and that shaft goes into the shock and displaces that much oil. And that oil has to go somewhere. And that's why and you have a reservoir. And it's pushing into the reservoir. But right. if you can choke it down, it resists Slower. that. Sure. Right. Yes. Whereas, so like, on your TRX shocks... It's different because it uses two uh, compression and rebound circuit controlled by spool valves, and it's not it's choking it through the flow of the shock, not through the orifice, or- orifice going yeah. to the reservoir. Or like Multimatic, same thing with their spool valve shocks. Now with the Multimatic, there you know there's some really novel stuff going in there, and for me, I really like that shock because especially on stock application where you only have like a four or five inch travel shock, they can displace a lot of energy in that really short stroke. So a ZR2 you know, or a, a, whether it's a Silverado or a Chevy um, Colorado, at the wheels, it's like, you know, 8 to 10 inches of travel versus, you know, a Raptor, which is 12 or 13 or a TRX. But in that short stroke, the shocks can do a lot. And it's just, it's again, it goes down to the different design. Well, and, and it's also the different shock valving. Like most people, when they're in the Raptor or TRX going down the road and they're bottoming out, that's more of a slow speed, not a high speed. So think about high speed hitting a... Um, like G out or something like that. No, that that or, would be the slow speed, but the high speed is more like hitting a curb or a parking stop. Mm-hmm. Real quick snap, right? And it's like, so when you choke down the reservoir, now it's, oh, okay, it's not yeah, moving. It hurts. It hurts. Right. Versus that, like, you know, hitting the Breathing. Row, yeah, the, the row of whoops or like entering yeah. your driveway would be more slow speed. If you're so. hitting your jounces, you're overdriving the chassis. And where, what you want is you want to be in that zone where the piston isn't getting to the end stop on either side. 
and is is going right in between the two sides without hitting either end. That's when it's breathing. That's that's where your vehicle's designed to be. Well, it's like my Raptor R. I was out at uh, King of the Hammers, and so you just picked up a Raptor R. So Jay yes. kind of alluded no, to that. Another segue. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm in the Raptor R, and you know when you enter King of the Hammers, there's the road everyone's on, and then just to the right, it's whooped out, and they're not really big, but yeah. they're whoops. I can't even get the Raptor unless I'm like going fast. Yeah. I can't get the Raptor to stay. It just no, bouncing it's progress. so bouncing. Whatever mode it's in. And the TRX does the same thing. And it's just a simple thing. Like, you just need some more rebound control. But Ford's engineering that thing to be, like, 99% yeah. highway. Yeah. I'm a true off-road guy. So I, and like, I was surprised to find out that the Raptor R has the exact same suspension as the 37-inch non-Raptor R. It's it's the same stuff. So they yeah. didn't even upgrade the suspension, even though way more capability, well, way more it's power. It's an eighth of an inch bigger or something. That, yeah, I mean it's and they're black. Like so, there's this. I'm gonna do a video, like because I get like, oh, you know, what do you what tell us about the Raptor? Yeah. I'm gonna do what I don't like about yeah. the Raptor, and that's they put all black shocks on it, so, so they're nothing, hot. Well, they don't. Well, not the heat, but they just don't look cool. Like you look under, because they just fade into the rest of the truck. Yeah. Right? OE suspension. Right. Um, the key, like the Raptor R, it's got a red R at the end of it yeah. on everything. Wrapped the all key R. doesn't. The steering wheel doesn't. The Bronco. So Raptor, the branding consistency is in throughout. Yeah, it's like, yeah. like talk to us a little bit when yeah. you come out with these premium vehicles. They want so you want it to look high hand. You want to throw the key up on the bar right when you're with your buddy. It's just and the little thing. Yeah, yeah, you want it to look like a, a, a Bentley key or a Lambo key. Those things look legit. Yeah, the just keys. like your plastic Chinese anodized key cover. I don't, your I don't have it on me right now because oh. I drove the bends. But like, <laughs> I, so he makes fun of this little this little cover that I put on my key. But it's this chrome. It's actually the, almost the same color as this dark pepper can. It's very similar. And it's got the same reflectivity. Okay. And it's anodized plastic. And it's, it's anodized plastic. And I thought, this is a little cheesy, but I didn't want to beat up the key. And I got it. And I I have had dozens of compliments on the key. Because they it think, looks cool. Because they think the key, because it looks like a Ferrari key. Yeah. As if, if Ferrari had a, so a fob that on like Amazon? that. So I need to go to Amazon. I'll send yeah. you a link, I dude. I need to get a cool Raptor there key you go. on Amazon. Dude, I'm telling you. China. You it know. looks... Like you get one from Ford, but it's all way. black. Yeah. Yeah. He thinks it's lame, but I, I get compliments. Well, so check it out. So I had a silver Gen 3 Raptor. Yep. I come home in my Raptor R. My neighbor's like, oh, you removed the stickers. I'm like, no, this no, is the Raptor this R. This is the well, badass one. Like, they don't, they don't really get yeah. it. So I'm looking at, like, on top of the hood, the plastic's taller. Right. So when you're in it, my head, I tested this. Yeah. To look over the, you, you, the It cuts of off hood, some of your view. 100%. Yeah. I have to touch the top of my head to the headliner to be able to see everything the, over the, the hood. The Colorado ZR2, it's one of my biggest things. And the Toyota TRD Pro Tacoma, they all have this hood that rises in the middle for yeah. no reason for styling. And I'm like, no, make it rise on the side if you want to give it Correct. shape. The middle is what I'm looking at to read the trail ahead of me. Correct. And I hate that. And so we're, we're getting gnarly stuff yeah. when you're in Baja. So when you're yeah. like racing a, a race truck down in Baja, like you're going up and over yeah. mountains, all kinds of stuff. And visibility is very And important. there's no reason for that because the engine is way down in the chassis. It's Correct. not like you have a supercharger, something that made the engine deck tall, you know, taller or whatever. Anyways, they have this plastic thing on the sides, the Raptor yeah. R logo. So they put on the really small on the sides, it says Raptor with the red R. Yeah. You get red tow hooks, you get a little red R in the nose, you get a logo <laughs> on the back. But then, yep. you know, you look at a Toyota TRD Pro and they have those TRD Pro, yeah. TRD Pro badges on the well, doors. It's like TRD Bro because yeah. it's like every, like the passenger seat in front of you on the dash is like, TRD Bro. Like it's so giant. Yeah, <laughs> you but, know what you're in. Outside on the side, yeah. you know that's a pro. And the even, even on a TRD Pro on the new Tundra, it even has like, a, you know, a multicam. Uh, camouflage, like those shapes, like molded into the fender flares. So even the fender flare, when you look at it, is a little bit different than everything else. Yeah. Like it's those little tiny touches. Like you know it's a pro when you but see when it. But when you park, when, when you're driving down the road and you're in a Raptor R, the the doors at the bottom when they like kind of square up yeah. a little, it should have a Raptor R logo right there. Yeah, something. It, it just should. I mean, you, you talked about the, the Louis Vuittons and the Pradas and Gucci's and such. And those brands are expert at branding, at branding, and yeah. they put their logos everywhere. And sometimes it's bold, and sometimes it's subtle, Correct. but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And and you're right, Ford could take a, a, a few cues from that. I, I would think so. And then the other thing is the the Bronco Raptor carbon fiber has this killer trim in the steering wheel. Like the steering wheel is literally perfect. 
You get in a Raptor R, and keep in mind, they start at $109,000. Yeah, they're not cheap. The carbon, the, so my Gen 3 Raptor carbon looks like absolute crap. Like yeah. it's got little silver strands in it. Yeah. This Raptor, the carbon fiber looks legit. It's all mad. It, it's real carbon fiber. It's the real deal. And then they have this piano black molding everywhere yeah. inside, which is kind of cool, but it's going to get scratched. Yep. But I'm like, where's the carbon fiber on the steering wheel? Where's yeah. the little red on that logo? But they put the – it's in the headrest. The seats are killer. They're all like Alcantara, yeah. you know, like a Porsche. Because it's got the Recaros in it, right? Yeah. So it's got these Recaro seats. And then the the little armrest in the middle, that says Raptor R, which I wouldn't have done yeah. that because it's just – Because your get, arm's there. It's going to get yeah. dirty. I yeah. feel it on my arm and yeah. the T-shirt. Yeah. But it's, it's a feature that's there. But I'd rather not have that embroidery yeah. there and have the steering wheel, the have steering the little wheel, yeah. R. Well, think about it. The steering wheel is the thing. One thing you touch. That's your first Every impression. time you drive yeah. a car. So, so TRX steering wheel or the or the Raptor R? It's got to be. Because the, the, the TRX has got all, everything you've just mentioned. Yeah. The, the TRX. So when I drove a TRX, I was like kind of like, you know, I'm not a big Ram fan. I just haven't been. I know. And then I get in the, the TRX. And, I, and by the way, this is my first... Stellantis slash Chrysler product ever in my life. Okay, he's always been a Chevy guy, and, and I have okay. told, but I have been outspoken against. I am not a Chrysler slash FCA slash Stellantis fan. It wasn't until we drove around quite a bit in Holman's long term loaner that I'm like, all right, this might be the turning point for me. I was not a fan. I didn't like the quality. I didn't like the fit and finish. I, none of it. And the TRX was like. Mm. It's a it's a cool truck. So I, I drove one back from Vegas, and you know I stepped on it, took it off road. You know I kind of put it through its paces. And my first impressions, like okay, the steering wheel is pretty dope. Like I like that. Um, it feels more sport. cockpit to me than the Raptor. Yeah, the Raptor in the F one fifty is a very like like flat face to the dash. It's very comfortable. Uh, the TRX just feels like it's more like a glove. Like it just feels like it's around you more. It feels a little sportier. A little sportier. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like the... Visibility seems a little sportier out of the Ram too. Yeah. I mean, visibility was a very similar. I feel like all these trucks nowadays are just so big. Yeah. Um, and like you said, like everything is like way down lower yeah. and they don't need to be that big, but it's just kind of how they make them. Yeah. Um, I do like the JCOs on the front of the uh, TRX though. Having the hydraulic bump stops inside the shocks, okay. those things are awesome. I yeah, mean, they take. It's amazing how much force. I mean, that I takes. drove it off road, and I was like, I mean, but keep in mind, like we build suspension. And yeah, yeah, these yeah. Things way You're better. coming from different lens. Yeah, total different lens. And to me, it's like what's there can be heavily improved upon. But I'm sure the manufacturers have like the reasoning. Yeah, and it's comfort. So when you drive the Raptor down the road or the TRX down the road, and you're on the freeway, and it's real hoppy, like it's yeah. super comfortable. Yeah. And so I feel like the Ford is. It's like the modern day seven series or the modern day S five fifty Mercedes, just so comfortable. Yep. But the power, man, I mean, it's like between the TRX and the Raptor, they're both very similar like yeah. that. But it's seven hundred horsepower yeah. with the supercharger and the yeah. noise it makes. Yeah. Which, by the way, Magnaflow has my Raptor and they're doing an exhaust on it right now. Um, we're going to go down to uh, Anza Borrego on Tuesday. I was supposed to be on that trip with you guys. Are you we, going? Well, we, well, I was supposed to. We we're going to. Rich called me up because we we're going to put. Uh, Exhaust on the uh, 392. Okay. But I'm going to be out of town, and just the dates just didn't work out. So, What's more important than off-roading, bro? Uh, off-roading. <laughs> Other off-roading? Okay. Oh, you are going off-roading. I'm going it, to Utah, is, yeah. No, that's your okay. Moab trip, yeah. No, 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 this is Moab. I'm going to go see Britain American Venture Lab because we had, we've had a date for like two or three months to do the, all the interior, the onboard air, the onboard battery system, the, the cargo, all that stuff. So, Got it. The exhaust noises are beautiful. It's back to that V8. And it's not even just a normal V8. It's just a big pissed off V8. And how much uh, supercharger wine are you uh, getting? You hear it. It's not crazy, but you do hear it, which I think in some senses is kind of cool. There, there are guys like, uh, I'm, of course, I'm on all the, all the TRX groups on Facebook, and I'm actually on a couple Raptor groups. There's all these dudes making tubular four-inch air boxes. So it's, it comes straight out of the, the supercharger inlet. Right into a steel airbox, which none of this is good for performance, but it resonates like a mofo, and you could just get so much wine. The guy's like, "Truck's got plenty of power for me. I don't really care about two, three horsepower for an intake. I just want noise." And they just put it on. Wow. I think JMB is one of the companies, and there's a few of these. They're just making these all steel. Like Gail Banks would pull what little hair he has out of his head, like looking at these intakes. Yeah. But guys are buying them left and right because they want the noise. It's rare. Well, it's like the, the Gen two, Gen three Raptor guys that are like wastegates. Yeah. I gotta hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you make a Honda Civic noise? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ooh, 
<laughs> and that's where the raptor are. I mean, man, it's just how, how different is it? Because I had our long-term raptor <clears throat> before I didn't. And uh, I it won four-wheeler pickup truck of the year. But driving it every day, I was kind of underwhelmed because my previous vehicle for a year was the TRX. And it just, it drones a lot. It felt down on power, obviously. Where it's, it's amazing where 450 horsepower doesn't feel... Well, Good yeah, enough. you're on your way to Mammoth. I remember I'm on my way to Mammoth, and I'm passing someone, and I'm like, wow, that's not so great. Like, it should be yeah. better than that. Where this yeah. Raptor R is, like, it just wants yeah. to keep – it'll – yeah. Just keep pulling. And I think that there's – you know, Ford has some extra, like – and they've always been this way – body on frame jiggles that make it through the cab. So there's some secondary motions that kind of over a, a heave or something or a broken pavement you can feel through the structure. And I think part of it's because the aluminum is so much lighter weight. It just, just doesn't control some of those vibrations as well. And so that was kind of that stuff. And I just – I was – eh. So – and I haven't driven a, a Raptor R yet. And uh, I'm, I'm curious because I think it would solve a lot of the things I didn't like about oh, the – Oh, it's, it's triple over. It's what it should be. I would agree. I would say a Ford could make you could twenty five thousand de- Raptor. I don't know how many regular yeah. Raptors they sell, but just say it's twenty five thousand. Yeah. Maybe it's fifty thousand. They'd sell them all for a hundred grand. Yeah. What they should do is take that engine, or just the Coyote, detune it, no supercharger, and make that the engine instead of the V six. I think it would be to me. The, the V6 just sounds so bad. I think that Godzilla engine come, should come to It should. Yeah. Like yeah. That Seven be... three. It's actually way more compact than the 5 liter. Is it really? In terms of yeah, yeah, width, yeah, yeah because liter. it's an overhead valve. But yeah, I think if that engine went in, there's those guys <laughs> amazing. at uh, Juicy Motorsports. Yeah, we saw them at SEMA. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that we interviewed those guys. All the cameras. Everything. I think they yeah, were yeah, in, awesome. in the HP Tuners booth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, that truck's badass. But I mean, I can only imagine just how freaking cool No, I bet it's awesome. And it's all torque. You don't have to worry about your supercharger, you know, whatever. It's all big displacement. Yeah. The stuff you love for racing supercharger is fine but big displacement out in the desert that's one of the reasons i went from a supercharged v6 wrangler to a 392 yes because i don't have to worry about any kind of spooling up or anything it's just big just fat goes. linear power all the time 100 percent. it's just stupid yeah on the way back from koh um i kind of was reminiscing my childhood my friend's grandma used to live off bear valley in central so you oh, head, yeah. up, head up central towards big bear and then you get to the end you turn left and it goes into these dirt roads and we wound up on these cool dirt trails. They just kind of go everywhere. Yeah. It's cool. And the biggest thing with the Raptor R is you just put it in the off-road mode so it's in four high. Yeah. And it feels trophy truck. Like, you yeah. want to know what the power off-road feels? It's, it's very, very close. Similar. Um, I mean, even a spec truck is like, what, 650 or something like no, that? Yeah, like the 525 LS3, yeah. you know. But, and, I mean, they have good power. And, and everything, like the trophy truck or the, uh, the 6100 truck, down low, they're very similar yeah. because you can only go so much until the tires just smoke the ground. Sure. Um, it, the biggest difference between the two is just the legs it has later yeah. in life. So from 80 to 120 is or 130 off the chart. is off the chart yeah. where the spec trucks like eight, you know, yeah. like the 80 to 110 is. Yeah, I get to ride with uh, with Ryan Arciero on some test and tunes in both the spec truck and then his trophy truck. Yeah. And it was just freaking I mean, side by side, like that. You amazing. Feel, yeah, it's that zero yeah. to sixty is yeah. very similar in both of them. But the top but end of that, that is yeah. was Nightmare. mind blowing. Like when you know we were taking you know from racing off road, there's you know a, a ninety degree intersection. Yeah. And trophy trucks have you know three feet of travel. Yeah. And Ryan basically cuts the triangle, you know, just full throttle sideways over a two foot berm where the intersection is. So he's not on the road. He just cuts that corner and. You're looking out as the passenger, and you could touch the ground. There's so much body roll, and all four tires still on the ground, just yeah. soaking it up. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just going. The first time he did that, I was like, "Well, like, I was uncomfortable get, for a yeah, second." Yeah. And then it, you, you thought my spine is going to come out my ass. But then you realize that that the truck is actually planted. It's the body that's moving. And well, it's yeah. crazy. And we turn like we don't use the brakes and slow down. No, and turn. Use you, the throttle and pitch the rear yeah, around. You let so your you foot reset. off the yeah. gas. It lets the yeah. back end come out from under and you. Stab it sideways, through, <laughs> and you hit the berm on the yeah. other side when you're back on the gas. That's oh, why you amazing! See it roosting everywhere. Oh, dude, it was um, so much fun. That was rad. Yeah, and so that's that's the hardest part. Like people are like, "Oh, why aren't you racing sports cars?" I'm like, "Because I'll never know how to." Yeah, like I have so many bad habits. Oh yeah, like, it's like the I'm difference ingrained. between street motorcycles and and dirt bikes. Same thing. You know, you have to recalibrate your engine. And like, but, but you're not going to. No, like an off road no. guy. Like if you grow up off roading. Yeah. 
Um, if you're about to wipe out on a dirt bike, you stab it and get ahead of it. On yeah. a street bike, that's not what you want to do, yeah. right? Those types of little things. Yeah, and it's the it's like the road race things. stuff. Yeah, but it, no, it's like you you could learn it, but it's yeah. it's that whole precision versus like being sloppy. Off roads yeah. very sloppy but calculated. Yeah, a lot a lot of room for air. The window's bigger. Yeah, and but that's how you turn and drive them versus yeah. like the road stuff. Is it's like, wild. Yeah, it's why it's so precision. This right? is the first time I was ever in a trophy truck, and I was just like, my breath was taken away yeah. from it. I mean, we were we went through the whoops at 117 on the GPS, and I'm yeah. thinking, this is double the highway speed over three and four foot whoops. Yeah, and you're just it's, but you can't go slower. because no, the truck won't the truck work. will you slam it. You have to yeah. have that through so that you can carry the tops, the tabletops. Of, yeah. The, oh, it was amazing. And that's, Ugh. but that feeling, like when I get in the Raptors, sorry guys, and the I'm TRX, a little tight in the pants. Just thinking about it, it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, and that's the feeling, you know, when when I get in the TRXs and the Raptors OE, yeah. Yeah. where you're like, this thing can totally work better over this stuff. Yeah, and they just don't. You're just spoiled. Yeah, because you know, most guys will never know what that well, next level is like. This is the next level but for so, a lot of people. So Holman and I have talked about that with with some of the you know with the Raptor and with the TRX, and you got companies that rip that stuff out, the stock stuff, and we're like, damn. I'm like that's better than ninety nine point nine percent of the people will ever need. Definitely, and you're still ripping it out. And we go on our overland trips down to Baja and Utah and all these places, and we have guys that just have like the Camberg Spring preload with the upper arm, and they get all the accessories for camping, and they're going still on works. The trips. It still works great. Yep. I mean, the, you got to think of like what the OEs have given us is awesome. Yeah, but they've also given us a really cool platform to start with. That because there was some design engineering into the platform where it's like, okay, now you could modify this, right? Where there are other brands out there and there's like zero ability to really modify what they give you. And that's why like, hey, you know, why don't you make parts for truck XYZ? I'm like, well, because I can't really do anything with that because the steering rack's out of a little teeny car. Sure. Or the ball joints are too small and the spindle's too small. So like we can make parts, make it better, but then it's going to fall apart. Yeah. And so that's where, like, you know, the Tacomas, Tundras, and Chevy Silverados and Fords are so popular because they've made them beefy enough to be able to be modified. And then the Raptors on top of that are, like, another level, and um, so I mean, that's it's been a, really good. It's a good time to be a truck guy. Yeah. It is. So uh, what's – I mean, we talked about a little bit. What's next for, for you? Really just planning right now, like, you know, hit, hitting the list of all the stuff we're going to do. We have – a lot of really cool tricks up our sleeve right now. I mean, I just... Are you finding that you had ideas but didn't have the definitely. resource to execute? 100%. And now you're going back to that notepad going, now's yes. the time? We're, he had the answer ready before you asked the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's there's a lot of excitement right awesome, now. Dude. And then now it's not like, hey, you know, we have this for the Tacoma. Yeah. Hey, we have this for yeah. the Raptor. No, we're going to have this for everything. And I'm talking like mic drop. Yeah. I'm talking like... Dude, I'm waiting for it. I'm excited. Like long travel. I've, I've, like I've known... Maverick. I've known you before I was ever a magazine guy. I've probably known you over that. 25 years. Yeah. I mean, coming into the Very shop beginning. as a Huntington Beach kid going, oh, we can, I, like, okay, I'll come back when I have money, right? Uh, yeah. Can I have a sticker? Um, so to, to watch your success and then be friends with you and and now see to, you've gotten the business to a point where it was acquired by somebody, but they still want you and Jason around. And I'm excited for what's next. And I, I appreciate you coming out and hanging out with us today. Yeah, no, thank you for having me again. I mean, I, I love you guys and love everything you guys are doing. Any, anyone who's like growing like, the truck culture and like living it, like I just really appreciate because that's where my passion's at. Yeah, and um, that's that's honestly the most exciting part is like I feel like I'm one of those employees at Disney in the '60s in the Imagineering department. Yeah, where like you get it, you you go, hey, we, we're gonna do Autotopia and just gonna, <laughs> like, make yeah. me so happy, you know? Yeah. Like I get, I have that cars and hydrocarbons. Let's let's start this culture, yes, right? We and, need the Autopia for today to get this next generation of kids excited. Oh, totally, right? yeah, and it's it's so fun because we get to um we get to build what we want to build, and. and you know, the Pallone family, I mean, they're so fired up. Like, yeah. they're so excited to see this happen. And there's some ideas that we're, we're bringing to light. Like, hey, you know, we've been kind of holding off on this one yeah. for a few years. Check it out. And they're just giddy over it because awesome. they see it. They see yeah. the potential. And when you think about how many trucks are on the road and what we know how to do. And it's funny because there's a lot of suspension companies out there. They've been in business a long time. Yeah. yeah. And they just don't get it. Yeah. And, and they're not going to. Because they're, they're, they're selling to the highest common denominator and making their money. They're not necessarily catering to the enthusiast or the performance person, right? Well, like it's different. Like, well, I, I'm excited for you. Sorry to interrupt. I'm excited for you to be able to get the word out further because 
your marketing has been limited to your budget, you personally, you're good, really good at marketing. But Magnaflow's marketing is much bigger. They've got a blowtorch, right? Yes. And I'm on these groups all the time, and I see guys buying upper control arms from company A, company B, whatever, and they think it's the sh And I have to go, I'll literally butt into a conversation that I'm not a part of, right? It's these guys, they are got a Ram 2500, whatever. You would do that? I've I never, I've all time. never, <laughs> never seen that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And I'm like, have you considered this? And I was like, oh, I already bought them. I'm like, oh my. He's like, why? Then just walk like, away. Yeah. And I, don't, I have don't to. poop on the dude's I, sale. I, I no, have there's to, some bad I, stuff I, out there. there. And there is, some, is stuff. some really booger wielded stuff that these guys are putting on $110,000 trucks. Yeah. The one and that gets me is like, like, oh my God. There's a company that's known for their alignment solutions. Mm. And a lot of Toyota guys, because like, I know where they're shopping, they're like not direct with Camberg or they, you know, whatever it is. They're like, oh, these arms are badass. Like these are what you put on your off-road. And there's video after video after video where the ball joints like literally pulling, the balls pulling <laughs> out of the body because they're made oh in China. Yeah. And they have an adjustable ball joint. So they're told like, oh, you know, you got less caster, you fit bigger tires, it doesn't rub on the firewall. I'm like, sorry to break the news. But you yeah. need more caster so it can handle correctly. And the difference of tire fitting, you're talking a half an inch. Yeah. Like when you rack back that spindle, we're going to do a whole video on this, mm. like, you know, the, the myth of this. Please yeah. do. Please do. But like these guys are putting zero caster. So imagine like lifting a Jeep or any straight axle yeah. three inches yep. and you don't change the lower arms. Right. Which the you're, arms are at a giant angle. Yeah. You're and, all over the road. Yeah. Your caster all over, all over the steering's too quick and really flighty. And well, yeah. It feels you make loose. a lane change, you let go yeah. and you're in the curb versus yeah. it straightening back mm -hmm. out. Well, we, we will allow for more caster or maintain yeah. the stock. Which you arguably want more caster in off-roading because you, you want it. more control. Well, because you're on ice. You're yeah. on the dirt. Yeah. So when you try the, the to surface turn is, the dirt, Yeah, and the surface isn't even. It's yeah. not this perfectly smooth pavement. Correct. Yeah, the crown may be on the right side instead of the left. Yeah, I mean, so for all you guys out there, what caster is, is imagine your bicycle if the forks went straight up and down yeah. versus the rake that they yeah. have. So the more rake you have, the better it's going to handle. Yeah. And the less rake you have, the worse it's going to handle. Like, it's going to be darty. Yep. And so in your truck, when you're in the dirt, you want more of that rake, a little negative camber, and it's going to yeah. handle so much better. And we get this all the time. Like, oh, you know, I bought these arms and, you know, it just... Say no more. I know your problem. <laughs> it handles like crap. And I'm yeah. like, oh, well, you mm. need these. You know, well, I got 35s on my Tacoma. I'm like, well, 35s <laughs> will never fit on your Tacoma. No. If you're actually off-roading. Nope. Now, not, not, not unless you love a Sawzall. Yeah. I and mean, you're still so, probably going to hit the uh, the uh, firewall. Everything. Yeah. You'll hit everything. Yeah. The, the hood's like going <laughs> to unlatch. You, uh, I mean, when you started this endeavor, you didn't realize that you were going to be an educator. We actually were educating from day one. And it was very difficult because people just don't know. And everyone has to know the answer. I mean, you'd probably deal with that at banks, right? Like every day. all day long. Every day. I oh, deal with that buddy. with lightning every day. How dare you? It's true, unfortunately. Ring the bell. <laughs> I love that the guest is here to tell me when it's all right to ring the bell. It's great. Yeah. What so, the hell is wrong with you? Sometimes I feel bad because I'm lightning, like... Lightning, 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 that's, that's, that's Holman. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's because it. he'll say something. I go, it's not how... He goes, what, what do you mean? Or, or I'll tell him, hey... Uh, that, that Don't put that in the show. And he goes, why? Because that's not how that... He goes, what? So every once in a while, we'll have that lightning mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear it sucking. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, appreciate yeah. it. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. If they, yeah. if people want to follow you, obviously, uh, Camberg.com, at Camberg. Uh, your personal yeah it's at, at Camberg Racing's okay. all the social Camberg.com's a website uh, Jerry Zayden's the social for me and at Supercar Jerry too that's like a fun yeah. sports car page no it's fun yeah. I, I follow it and then uh, you still have it at Jeeps only too right yep Jeeps underscore only mm -hmm. um, Jeep page we'll follow our friend Jerry and uh, the future know. is bright for our uh, our young Padawan over here are you talking about me? I'm the youngest no. one in the room. Well, no. <laughs> he looks younger, sadly. Oh, man. Yeah, he's he's fit. and Yep. yep. Doesn't have the gray beard nor the no. pot belly. No. Well, he hasn't, gray, he hasn't grown his beard out, so mm -hmm. you, we, I have. we don't know. I had one. Is it gray? Really? There's like a couple of them. Uh. I got excited. <laughs> like, I'm like, I finally got a couple of them coming in. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Well, silver fox. Yeah. Does your wife like younger Jerry or, or mature Jerry? I don't. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> no, Jerry. I just do what she says. I just do what she says. No, no, she's great. Um, yeah, we're both growing old together. <laughs> Dude, you you dropped a bomb on your driveway for her uh, like a couple weeks ago. That ride. 
Oh, the Christmas gift? Yes. Yeah, that was pretty cool. He bought her a, it was a Cayenne twin turbo? Yeah, the GTS. Yeah. Por- I hope you have a Porsche guy, because that, <laughs> that's lightning ringing my bell. Yeah. That, that guy must love you right now. It's pretty neat. It's yeah. pretty neat. She's like, like, I just, I married you when you were some surfer who was in some shop making truck parts. Well, she doesn't even, she's like, why did I get a G? Like, I don't <laughs> care. You're like, oh, Zach and Jerry, this, this yeah. is what I get. Zach and Jerry like the sounds of the engine. <laughs> Bro, like it's like, I did a, a video on my YouTube page. It's like cold start. Which one's better? Like yeah. the, the the Raptor R or the Ra- Porsche? Yeah, I don't, did I do all three yet? I think I did. But yeah, so it's like the the Porsche GTS, <laughs> the Cayenne GTS yep. starting or the GT3. I'm just like, oh, the GTS is. <laughs> it's a twin turbo V8. It's yeah. basically the Lamborghini Urus but yeah. in a Porsche body. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just rad. And then like I drive it. Like we left church today, and like I put it in the sport mode, like going down the road. <laughs> All of a sudden, like, bra. Dude, I'm in my not my boat, but I'm on a boat, like cruising through the channel at Havasu. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just so bitch. Oh. It's so cool. Love it. All right. Well, when uh, when you get the exhaust on the Raptor R, we, we got to hear it. Oh yes. All right. Yeah. All right. All about it. I'll bring cool. it by your house and All right, well, like, tell we'll, your neighbor sorry when I leave. Oh, perfect. I've got a guy two doors down who's got the loudest uh, Hummer that you've ever heard. Well, I was thinking yeah. of the smoky tire burnout. Oh, that's fine. And yeah. then I've got the 392, which is awesome for cold start. And they were used to the TRX here. He he came with his uh, Borla-equipped uh, TRX, and uh, I had a neighbor who lives uh, two streets down. It was about midnight when I left, by she, the way. She texted me, by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Congrats on the success as always, Jerry. Yeah. Thank you, guys. All right, well, that was cool. How do you feel about some five-star hotline? Let's do it. Oh, come on and be part of the show. Call the five-star hotline. 657-205-6105. It's the five-star hotline. Five-star hotline. Hey, this is Ryan. I've called a few times before, but never left my name, so there's the name. You guys are trying to figure out T-shirts and hats. Here is the most perfect T-shirt for you guys. This is lightning speaking because he always thinks and nobody can tell the difference in your voices. <laughs> perfect T-shirt. This is lightning speaking. <laughs> you guys have a great day. Right, that's good. That's. Uh, I like how he insulted me, and yet I think it's funny. Yeah, okay. Good, good work, listener. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Brian. 657-205-6105, 657-205-6105 is the five-star hotline. Hey, guys, it's Colby calling again. Um, just listening to this recent Power Stroke episode, and then in the news, you brought up the whole, like, legalities of these high-end stuff that they're not allowed to sell afterwards and or they'll lose their warranty. And I just, like, I find that to be such bull crap. Like, the, the manufacturer's are allowing these dealerships to charge forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars over MSRP, and that's fine. But heaven forbid some dude wants to sell his truck after he has it for a little while, and he can't. Like I just find that completely crazy that the, the dealers are making more money, but the, the little guy can't. Like crazy. Anyway, keep up the good work, guys, and your your hotline still says brand new and you're not <laughs> yeah anymore. anyway bye funny he should say that because uh i realized that my voicemail on my personal phone is i probably did at the same time i did still the, says motor trend uh, i don't know it still it doesn't say anything about any of the businesses or i have all these people calling me and it's just like hey the sean leave a message no so you I need to change those like hey it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's sean Holman from uh truck famous yeah, and truck famous used for adventure ovr mag like just go on down the list uh, I need to make a tri-fold business card that has all the ventures <laughs> that I'm currently in. Uh, it's going to be... So Colby crazy. was talking about uh, car automotive manufacturers that are clamping down on people flipping vehicles, right? Right. I think the most famous one was over uh, John Cena and Ford over the Ford GT. So uh, that, you know, you read all about that in the news. I think John Cena actually ended up winning that also. So I don't know how tight these... Restrictions are anyway. He's referring to a story where a guy bought a new, uh, it was a Cadillac Escalade or something like that, a V series, and then refinanced it. And so GM saw it as an ownership change and they voided his warranty because it went against his contract. He said, No, 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 I still own it. I just refinanced it so my payments would be less. 
mind boggling. Yeah, they took issue with that. Um, so I don't know what the status is on that. I'd, I'd be interested we, to find we out. Do need, I have trolled for it. I haven't seen yeah. any status update. It, I don't know. I get it, but if you bought it, eh, you know. Yeah. Lightning and whole dog. Uh, Colby again <laughs> here. Dog. I don't know. Uh, question for you, seeing if you guys have an answer for me. So I am a game warden in one of the western states, and my agency uses Chevrolet pickups and GMC pickups, and they all have this gaslit or gas capless gas cap, right, like the little flapper valve. And we have been having nothing but problems with these because the amount of dirt roads that I'm on, the the flapper will get a little bit of dust in there, and then it will stick open. And then next thing you know, you're, you know, one dirt road later, you're sucking gallons of dirt into your 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 gas tank, which ends up getting pumped through your whole system. And we've had trucks like I I have a 17. Silverado and uh, yeah, I, I, we had to replace fuel lines and fuel pump and injectors and all that jazz after it sucked in a whole bunch of dirt. And like the dealers just keep telling us to put on these locking gas caps, which have no seal in them. There's no way that it's still keeping the dirt out of there. Anyway, is there any option that you know of, Sean or Lightning, that would do anything to prevent this dirt? I mean, there's there's guys in my department that are sticking corks into there just so they don't <laughs> well, that's, seems rudimentary anyway huh. any ideas i Thanks, do guys keep up the good work yeah uh, as a matter of fact if you go on to uh, amazon.com as uh, most of us have probably done oh i know you, you, what you're you're gonna sell something right now for amazon when we should have this on truckshowpodcast.com and we should make it a freaking bonus off this or whatever they do what? we should be an affiliate or affiliate something. yes yeah, right. and we're not and i right. need to get my ass in gear right. and put that on our site got it and launch right. the site can you let me give the answer go ahead all right so if you uh, actually type in generic general motors capless fuel system fuel cap it will come up. It's fifteen dollars, and it's a uh, 3D printed from TPU. Uh, it's basically a screw-on cap or a cap that is made for these capless systems to essentially keep all the the gunk out. Uh, like I said, it's uh, it's about fifteen bucks, and it's uh, 3D printed. Uh, it fits most GM capless systems, and uh, it actually has f- ninety-five four and a half star ratings on it. So uh, it seems legit. And there's all sorts of pictures of people with GM vehicles, uh, Silverados and CTSVs and all the, uh, all other uh, sorts of things that have this fuel cap over the capless system. Mine, my truck, my TRX, mm-hmm. little flapper. Yep. Bugs me. But that, I mean, that's that's how they all are going uh, to it. Uh, and I have, uh, I don't like them. Uh, but we've tested them, you know, thousands of miles in the dirt, and I've never had an issue. Obviously, a game warden vehicle is probably be a little uh, worse than the testing I did the magazine. But some of the reviews on here are like, super product, perfect fit, 2022 Camaro LT1, effective solution for a problem that shouldn't exist in the first place. Gas cap Chevy don't know about dirt in their air in Nebraska. <laughs> uh, from Dr. Otology, um, perfect fit. Uh, so it looks like this is the answer to your question. And at 15 bucks, it seems pretty uh, affordable. And uh, Amazon has a uh, uh, 15% coupon on it currently. So uh, I would say check that out. And I think you're uh, you're good to go. They even have magnetic versions I see here. Yeah, and there's one from Dorman, who Dorman makes a whole lot of different uh, parts. They also have a capless fuel neck cover compatible um, that one's uh, 12 bucks so but it doesn't have as nearly the number of reviews as this other one so there are options on amazon and uh for all of you with a, a capless fuel system wondering why they did that it's because if you ever uh noticed if somebody doesn't put their cap back on or you don't screw it on you can obd2 check engine light because they don't want the emissions venting and so as for the manufacturers to cut down on their emissions they have to prove that they have a way to eliminate that problem so the way they did that was with no fuel cap Obviously, uh, it may keep things from leaking out. It doesn't keep things from going in. In, And while you may have a fuel filter and all that, it can still cause other contamination issues. But it solves a big problem with the EPA for them and federalizing their vehicles. That's why they exist. Get the cap. No more problems. Should be good to go. So what you're searching for on Amazon, again, is uh, generic General Motors capless fuel system fuel cap. Mouthful. Um, I don't see one for the Ram, but hopefully they'll come out with one soon. But at least you GM guys are taken care of. Now, hold on. <laughs> what are you laughing? Did you just have Dr. Pepper cope your nose? No, I was going to say. What was that? No, I was going to say. Now, hold on. This is lightning speaking. <laughs> What's wrong with you? No, because the guy busted me for it. And I thought it'd be funny. Anyway. Uh, listen, people, so, we don't sound alike. 
at all. Not at all. No, but I don't know Not why you always say that. But that. But listen, how do they know the name for the person? They know the voices are different. Uh-huh. How do they know who's speaking? What if you're What if you're Lightning? Well, then what if I'm Holman? That would be a bizarre I, world. I agree with you. Uh-huh. So that's why I say this is Lightning speaking. So I should take your Mercedes home to your house tonight. I mean, my wife would appreciate that. <laughs> She's tired of my <laughs> that'd ass. That'd be weird. <laughs> All right. Here's, here's, uh, here's the deal. We were going to do news. We'll get to it next episode because uh, our interview with uh, Jerry was... Uh, it was awesomely lengthy. long. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, uh, oh, it was I like that. I, awesomely long. Yeah. I like that. Okay. I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. So uh, we what we are going to do, though, is thank you guys, because on Apple, we're at uh, 1,013 reviews. Woo! So, and uh, you guys have left a, a bunch of reviews for us, so we haven't done these in a while. So I figured uh, let's do those before we uh, end the show. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Five, 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 five. Stars. Five stars. Right back at you, brother. Yeah! Yeah! Oh! oh! Nailed it! Nailed it! Nailed that! Oh my god. Yes! Wow, can you do two for two? Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Five, 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 five. Stars. Five stars. Right back at you, brother. Oh, I was a little fast. I was on time. I was on time, but I was a little fast. Woo! Oh man, the adrenaline's pumping out. Yeah, that, that was good. I wonder if really you good. guys do that in your cars. Do you try and like do that with us? I'm just curious. Truck show podcast I don't think at they, gmail.com. I don't think they would admit it. 657-205-6105. I want I want to know. Like, do you guys sing along with the uh, the jingles still? Do you do you try and guess these silly little games that we have? No? Yeah. Lightning shrugging your shoulders. I, I don't know. I know I don't have it. appears any, to be I, unimpressed by I this don't line have of any questioning. Clue. All right. Hey, uh, we got this one here from at O-J-C-A-Z-A-R-E-S. O-J Kazaris? It says, uh, the best. Such a great show. And five stars. Congratulations. You have earned five stars. Thank you. Got another one here from uh, BRS2427. Says, uh, five star review. Thanks so much for all the great truck content. Very informative and entertaining. Audio quality is excellent. Well, not anymore. We're working on it, guys. Uh, start my week every Monday with the podcast and five stars. Five star five. review. Five stars. Get this one from RL from the Gem State says, favorite podcast, Lightning and Holman. And this is a long one. All I can say is thank you. Been listening since episode three or four, roughly. Got a new work iPhone and had to leave another five stars right back at your review. I wish you both so much luck on the new beginnings. Talk about exciting. I understand the challenges of a small business, and I think you two will kill it with this round and your experience and sage wisdom that comes with age, at least some age. A searchable catalog of products and brands that have been on the show in the past would be super helpful. That's one of the things that we're working on. Bring back the Bill Stein and Toyo guy. I can listen to them get in the weeds all day. Gail is a national treasure. Here's another one that I can listen to all day long. I'll put Holman and Lightning in the category, too. I have one thought around the Toa Sode. I kind of doubt you're going to get a representative from a manufacturer <laughs> of whatever to speak on the subject, strictly from a liability standpoint. But why not get a handful of people with tons of experience with the subject, like maybe a Smith system safety trainer or some truck drivers that have done lots of it. I've towed everything from farm wagons, hauling hay, cattle trailers, to cargo haulers, to gooseneck flatbeds, to dual trailer milk trucks on in a previous job. I still hold an unrestricted CDL with all endorsements except for hazmat and passenger bus. It would be some work for you guys to figure out who would be good enough to put on the podcast, but I think that would maybe be the most educational way to go. Get four or five individuals with a wide range of experience from large to small. Most of the basics and concepts are the same. It all revolves around being safe and starting and finishing the day with the shiny side up. How everything is loaded, road conditions, and knowing your equipment are the biggest keys to success in towing. Good luck to you both. I'm excited to experience the next season of what Truck Famous can bring. Uh, and again, that was from RL, and uh, I think he just did our tow episode for us. I, hold on a second. And he also says, five stars. No, wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop, yeah. stop. That was a review. That was a review. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay, well, then I, I got to give him. T-H-A-N-K-Y-O-U. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. All right, got this one from uh, Jeremy. E. Kennedy says, yeah, buddy. He says, keep up the good work. You can't just roll right through it. Yeah, Yeah, buddy. He says, keep up the good work. These guys have produced a great podcast for a long time, you're telling us. Uh, Tons of insight in the truck and SUV market. Always booking excellent guests. Excited to see what they'll do in their new season. Stoked to support all of your new endeavors. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Five-star review! Five-star! 
stars. Got this one from uh, looks like RG Ad says a punch. Is this, wait, is this a five star review? Five, 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 five stars. Five stars. <laughs> five stars. Five, can can five, he do it? Five. Five. five stars. Five stars. Right back at you, brother. Oh! It's pretty close. Wow, two out of three. Pretty close. I would consider that a... Okay. That was good. All right. Uh, this one says, Podshed, long-time listener, finally got an iPhone to rate you guys five stars. And he left us a five-star five review. Nice. All right. How, Congratulations. Don't talk you over this guy. five stars. All right. How about this one from uh, Jeej to four? It's always a treat to hear Gail Banks on the Truck Show podcast. Gail is one of those people who uses his words to paint a glorious visual piece of art. Bravo. And we got five stars. Those Thanks, are real Jeesh. high fives for you guys. These are real, real high, high fives. fives. These are not from uh, Jay's Simon Says Board. All right, got one more left here. We've got this one from uh, Nacho Fiven. <laughs> guys, I don't know how you name Nacho, yourself. Nacho Fiven? Not, Nacho Fiven. Of heaven. Hmm. Notch of heaven, I think is what it is. Notch, Notch of, of heaven. heaven. Yeah. It says, I love the Truck Show podcast. Hi, Lightning and Holman. I really enjoy the podcast with all your quirky jingles. How dare you? These are very serious jingles, of mm-hmm. course. Uh, and, of course, the gal with her parameters. I like your insights, and I hope you guys have much success going out into the scary world on your own. Hey, Lightning, have you heard? I gave you guys a five-star review. Again, wishing you much success on your new endeavors. Matt Lee. Out of uh, Neosho, Missouri, and he says, P.S., I'm so jealous of Holman's 392. I have a Gladiator in which they would produce a 392 version or even a 4xe, but I love my truck, even with the minivan engine. And uh, that's our friend Matt Lee, listener of the Truck Show podcast, leaving us five stars. So, guys, thank you so much for uh, clicking on the Apple Podcast app. It's where the uh, majority of our downloads come from. You guys definitely help us out by uh, by giving us five-star reviews on the Apple platform. And uh, we love you all for it. You can also do it at Spotify, but we prefer you to keep it to Apple. Truck Show Podcast at gmail.com is where you get a hold of us. The Truck Show, The Truck Show, The Truck Show. Oh, oh. And he's at LBC Lighting. I'm at Sean P. Holman, or we are at Truck Show Podcast on the uh, socials. You can also reach us at Podcast at gmail.com, as Lighting just said, or our five star hotline. 657-205-6105. You almost forgot. I almost forgot. Yeah, I did. But I did. 657-205-6105. At uh, Truck Show Podcast on Instagram, there's a call button. Just click that. And you can reach us also individually, uh, lightning at truckshowpodcast.com, Holman at truckshowpodcast.com. I don't get many of those because I think it's a little I confusing. Have, have you? No, I've been getting get people. Once, once or two. But. No, I've been getting a fair amount. People who just have a specific question that's not necessarily uh, show fodder. Is it lame if I... Post something every day, meaning let me let me, let me set the stage here because I'll go and post something on at LBC Lightning once or twice a week. Yeah, and it's usually fairly random. We've had this conversation yeah. before about random content. If I just say I'm going to post something every single day, is that weak sauce? No, I try and post every day, but it doesn't always uh, doesn't always work because it's like it, it would it is it bad? If, it would it be lame if it's a selfie? Should I just no. do what I'm working on at Bangs? Yes. Because I spend all of my day there. So I get there at 7, and I leave at 8 o'clock at night. Yeah, and you don't have time. So I don't really do anything and outside of Bangs during the day. And when hard. I get home, it's nighttime, so I can't show you the stuff I'm bolting on in my truck. Did you see the one I posted uh, back on, uh, oh, geez, January 30th of one of our listeners that DM'd me? No. He sends me a thing and says, this guy needs a tow episode. I write back, no doubt. He writes back. You responded right away. You pooping? <laughs> and I respond, highly likely. Yes. The fact that our podcast listeners know <laughs> that when I'm talking to them, I'm probably pooping oh, is hilarious. It's disgusting and not <laughs> funny. It's funny. No. Come on. No. Come on. No. Our oh, truck- no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Although it's kind of so bad that it's good. See? In a way. 100%. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, all right. Well, we got to thank Nissan. Uh, been with us almost five years, and uh, it's pretty incredible that if you bought a truck when this show started, you would you still, still have a warranty. Still have a warranty. <laughs> Head over to your local Nissan dealer or NissanUSA.com where you can build in price. Check out the uh, Frontier, the Nissan Titan, or the Nissan Titan XD. Of course, the uh, Titans come with the industry's best five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. And here's the thing. Most of us are not happy with our throttle response on our truck. 
You well, that's it. funny. I was going to say uh, co-host. <laughs> uh, there is that, yes. Well, except they don't have a co-host, most of them. Most of them. Just oh, you. it's just me. You. Oh, yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Strike that from the record. Uh, moving on with uh, Banks Battle No, Monster. the record is permanent. Oh, boy. Sorry, that's <laughs> embarrassing. So if you're looking to uh, to get some pep in the step of your, your pickup truck, uh, whether it's, it's gas, diesel, turbo, or naturally aspirated, the Pedal Monster will absolutely make your truck more fun to drive. And Banks makes them for cars, too. Head over to BanksPower.com and check out the patented Pedal Monster throttle controller. And one of the reasons it's the most popular throttle controller in the market is Full Moon Digital. They assist Banks in their search engine optimization, their Facebook campaigns, Google campaigns, TikTok campaigns, Snapchat campaigns, and more. When you're looking to beef up your online presence, Full Moon Digital is the answer. Turns out they also help the Truck Show podcast. They do indeed. All right, you guys. Love you, mean it. Bye. The Truck Show Podcast is a production of Truck Famous LLC. This podcast was created by Sean Holman and Jay Tillis with production elements by DJ Omar Khan. If you like what you've heard, please open your Apple Podcast or Spotify app and give us a five-star rating. And if you're a fan, there's no better way to show your support than by patronizing our sponsors. Some vehicles may have been harmed during the making of this podcast. Two squatted truck owners drive into a lumberyard. One of the men walks into the office and says, We need some 4 by 2s The clerk replies, You mean 2 by 4s don't you? The guy scratches his head and says, I'll go check, and goes back to the truck to consult with his buddy. He returns and says, Yeah, I meant 2 by 4s All right. How long do you need them? The guy pauses for a minute and says, I'd better go check. After a while, he returns to the office and says, A long time. We're gonna build a house.